welcome for people who have not been here. Um, I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies here at HQSD, and we uh, try to hold a lot of these types of events every year to uh, kind of focus, have focused discussion on key issues that confront uh, governments, policymakers, businesses in emerging market countries. And today's topic is the minimum wage. I want to thank uh, Shiba Lung, um, Professor and Chair of the Economics Department, for helping uh, to come up with the uh, invitation list for today's uh, event. Shobai and Wing Sun, who is also here, a professor at the University of Hong Kong, are both academic members of the Minimum Wage Commission of Hong Kong. Uh, so it's one reason why um, talking about the minimum wage here in Hong Kong now is, I think, uh, very helpful or very useful because the uh, commission will be in recommendation. I think they'll tell you a bit more about later, later this fall. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, two of the real world leading experts on the study of uh, the impacts of minimum wage on uh, employment here with us. Uh, David Newmark from UC uh, Irvine and John Addison from the University of South Carolina. Uh, and we also have uh, Li Shu here and uh, who's directing a major project on minimum wage in China. And so uh, Li Shu has also been very helpful recommending uh, the, the speakers here talking about China. So I think we have basically I think the best recent research on the minimum wage uh, in China represented in the papers that we presented uh, today, especially in the afternoon. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce the first speaker, who is uh, David. Well, thanks very much. It's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. I am. Um, my wife, I, we were, I were talking right before I left, and she said, what do you know about minimum wages in China? Why do they invite you? And I said, nothing. Um, so, um, uh, and you know, some issues cover cross, state, cross borders, and some probably don't. Um, but I'm really interested to, to learn a lot from, once John and I are, are done talking, uh, to learn about, a lot about from all of you, because I think uh, the topic is interesting. So I'm actually, this, you'll, you'll see the minimum wage isn't even the title of this paper. Uh, it's not because I brought the wrong paper. Um, it's because I'm going to give a paper that, that's, that's more of a, a, a policy overview, um, trying to ask the question, if we, if we want to increase jobs and we want to increase income from work, what do we do? And the, the context is a little bit because of this paper, it's a little bit tied to sort of the aftermath of the Great Recession when creating jobs is obviously a priority. Um, but it's a broader overview. It, it, I will certainly touch on a lot of stuff about minimum wages. Um, but I think it's useful. I, I talked to Albert about this sort of in deciding what to do because I had another sort of very technical paper on minimum wages. I think this is useful though because I think we, we often uh, can lose sight of the fact that the minimum wage is one of a possible set of policy tools, um, possibly complementary, possibly competing, who knows, um, to try to achieve certain labor market goals. And in some sense, talking about it or talking about any one policy in the context of what are the alternatives and how might they work together, I think can be not counterproductive, but you can really miss the boat. So. Um, it's not a detailed minimum wage paper. In fact, the first two-thirds probably isn't minimum wages at all. But it's all about policies, in some sense, directed to similar goals um, uh, of sort of improving labor markets for, for low-skilled workers. And I think, in that sense, it's useful. OK, so, um, so, so let me just put you, th this is sort of the, the specific, the policy perspective in the US, what people are talking about right now. We had the Great Recession. It was very, you know, very traumatic, obviously. And a number of things since then. We've had. Uh, very slow recovery of job creation, right? Until, until recently, it sped up a little, but not that much. Da big downward shift in labor force participation among the less skilled. Um, a big increase in long-term unemployment, okay? Um, changes in the wage distribution, so that there's, there's, there's um, and this is longer term than just the Great Recession, but David Otter and others have documented this kind of a, we, we've had declining wages at the bottom for a long time, but now we kind of have declining wages in the middle as well, right? So in some sense, the nature of inequality has changed. Um, and if anything, and that related to that point, if you look at where job growth has, has, has recovered most strongly since the recession, it's kind of way at the bottom, right? Now, to some extent, that's because that's where it got hit the most, so part of this is just counter-cyclical. But there is a concern um, that sort of our low to middle skill jobs are, are thinning out relative to what we used to have. Okay, so, so those, in some sense, are the problems we're trying to address. And obviously, when people talk about the minimum wage, um, they try not to talk about this for obvious reasons. No one really thinks they create jobs. That's not, that's, well, a few people. That's not really the debate, though. Um, obviously, uh, these two things people talk about a lot, right? The longer term growth in inequality and its exa apparent exacerbation uh, recently. 
Although you should keep in mind that when people talk about any, the real extreme changes in inequality in the U.S. are the really rich getting really richer, right? Which has nothing to do, of course, with minimum wages. So what are the possible policy responses? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about two things here. One is creating jobs. Um, which is not a minimum wage policy per se. The other, which is more directly about minimum wages, is trying to increase income from work. You know, the U.S. has gone away from sort of a very generous safety net with the reform of welfare. So we're not really in the business, we weren't very much before in the U.S., and even less so now, of giving people who aren't working much help, right? That's just the nature of our politics. Um, but there still is a lot of interest in if you're going to work, how do you make more? And obviously that's one potential role of the minimum wage. Okay, so uh, one issue I want to talk uh, briefly about is, is hiring credits, right? What can we do to actually incentivize job creation? Um, I'll talk about the higher minimum wage. Um, for those of you who have uh, followed what's going on re recently in the U.S., I put much higher here in parentheses because at the local level, um, there are minimum wages uh, being put in place or considered that are extraordinarily high. Seattle's passed a $15 minimum. San Francisco is, I assume, going to approve one this fall. Oakland, a rather depressed city. 12 and a half, LA is now considering a 12 and a half dollar minimum wage. This, I, I don't know exactly where these high minimum wages came from. And then of course we have the fast food strikes which you keep hearing about in the news, which is really a side issue, but they're talking about a $15 minimum wage federally, which obviously isn't gonna happen. But anyways, they're getting a lot of attention, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of consideration of a more substantial earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit is a, what they call in, 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 in the, the, in, in, on the continent, um, in work support, right? More, you know, subsidy for working, basically. Um, I'll talk about that. And the, the real, the real talk here is about extending it or really making it more than more than trivial for people without kids. That is, particularly men who don't have responsibility for children. Um, so I'll touch on some new evidence of minimum wages, but I said I want to focus on the broader question. Now, this talk is about the U.S. Obviously, this conference is about China. Um, so some of the stuff is very context specific, but I, I think a lot of it isn't. The results obviously are. Um, okay, so how do, you, how do you create jobs? Well, you know, broadly speaking, theory, we all have the, you know, when we teach labor economics, we always go through the, you know, do you tax, do you, do you, which side of the market do you tax, and it doesn't really matter, right? So you can create jobs through subsidizing employers to hire people or through subsidizing workers to work more, in theory. Okay, so the EITC is, of course, a subsidy to workers. The hiring credit is a subsidy uh, to firms. You know, in reality, it's not quite so simple. You know, the, the, the labor market isn't like the market for gasoline, right? We really think at the gas station, if you tax the buyer or seller, it doesn't make a difference, right? The labor market's, you know, it's different, right? These are people. So, for example, we have research from the hiring credit literature that says if I show up at an employer and say, you know, um, I'm kind of a loser and I have the certificate that gives me, lets you hire me for less, somehow employers, despite the lower wage, don't want to hire those people. We call that stigma. Right, so no one, you know, so again, that doesn't happen with a good, but it happens with a worker. So some advantages of the earned income tax credit in principle are employers don't know about it. Right, you work, you get money back from the government. Using it doesn't signal to an employer kind of who you are and what some of your unobserved characteristics might be. It's also re the other great thing about the EITC is it's very easy to administer. It's just done through the tax system. There's no welfare offices. There's no other eligibility. You file your income taxes. We see how much money you made. We see how many kids you have. Are you married? All that stuff and you, you know, your, your taxes adjust, and in some cases you get money back. So very easy to administer, essentially, not zero cost, but essentially. The problem is, um, I think, if you're, if you're talking about recovery from, a great re from the recession, uh, depends on your view of the macroeconomics, and we won't get into that debate here, but if you think the Great Recession was caused by a shortfall in demand, um, which is probably the consensus view, it's fair to say, right, then subsidizing labor supply isn't gonna do anything. Right? You're just sort of pushing on a string, right? Um, uh, whereas if you can actually get firms to hire more by, by lowering the cost of labor to firms, you can presumably do more. So for the purposes of this paper, where to kind of draw some boundaries about what I do, I'm going to focus on kind of the current period after the Great Recession. I think the EITC should not be viewed as a job creation strategy, even though it does increase employment in the long run, um, but mainly as an income support. You know, can, you get, can we get working people more money, right? And it is, it is quite effective at that, but I kind of want to restrict attention to it in that sense, so I'm going to come back to it later. I'm going to go through the job creation stuff and then come back to the EITC, much more direct contrast to the minimum wage. Okay, what about job creation through hiring credits? Well, um, if you read the literature in the U.S., as I, I sort of started doing this about five years ago, I started thinking about this, um, uh, partly because I kept telling people minimum wages were a bad idea, and they kept saying, what should we do instead? And I said, that's, that's a good question. So I started thinking, all right, what should we do instead? 
right? So I started reading the literature on hiring credits, and the literature on hiring credits is actually very negative. There's two reviews I cite here. Uh, sorry, one. There's another one. Uh, for, uh, well, I guess it's partly cats, but others. But it's a negative view of hiring credits. Kind of, it kind of says, you know, firms don't really take them up. Uh, they don't boost employment much. They create all kinds of problems. How do you subsidize, you know, net hiring that's created by the policy rather than the hiring that would have occurred anyways? What we call windfalls, right? I'm, you know, because so, even in the recession, even in the depths of the recession, some firms were hiring. So why do you want to subsidize that? So they're comp very complicated to administer. Um, uh, so um, pretty negative view, but but I think when you think about a hiring credit in the context of recovering from a from a steep recession, it's kind of different. Perhaps the most important reason is. Um, if you're, if you're unemployed, I don't know right now, but in 2010, if you were unemployed even for a long time, that wasn't a very negative signal, right? Lots of people lost their jobs, and it was not a reflection of their quality, right? So it's different. If you were unemployed in 1999 at the height of the Clinton boom, you were probably hard on your luck, right? Because the unemployment rate was getting down near 4%. When the unemployment rate 10%, a lot of people are unemployed, and it's not a negative signal. So you might think a higher in credit targeting unemployed workers might work better. Um, and then some of the other issues of windfall. We weren't, we, weren't, we weren't really that worried about were we subsidizing some job creation that would have occurred anyways because we were looking for any job creation we could get. Okay? So um, what do we know about counter-cyclical hiring credits? The only thing we have is from the late 1970s, this thing called the New Jobs, ta New Jobs Tax Credit, kind of in created to spur recovery from the very steep recessions in the early 1970s. Um, and this looks like it was actually pretty effective, although the research that was done then kind of doesn't really hold up to our current standards of how one infers that a policy worked. Okay? So, so uh, I wanted to talk very briefly about some work I did with a, a former grad student, now, now a, now a uh, professor, um, where we actually tried to learn about hiring credits. And we didn't really know this going in, but we, I, I, we sort of started saying, well, let's, I had sort of run across a few states enacting hiring credits. And it turns out when we did tons and tons and tons of legal research, um, that, that states have been passing hiring credits all over the place. The feds haven't done much. There was one as part of the Recovery Act, but it was very mild. But states have been quite aggressive on this. Um, so we wanted to kind of under, document, catalog these state hiring credits and figure out what they did. Um, uh, this is not easy. Have you ever tried reading, you know, I mean, one of the great things about the U.S. is we have 50 governments doing different policies, right, which is great for research. But it's also a real pain, right? Because you, now you're trying to trace uh, what 50 states are doing, programs that are not very, I mean, if I want to say what's a state minimum wage, that's an easy question to answer. If I want to say what is a state incentive to hire, you know, what about bids to get plants to move there? What about apprenticeship? I mean, there's so many things you could draw your, you know, sort of draw the parameters around. So we had to do a lot of restricting of things that were really focused on job creation, programs that were pretty broad, not really narrow, programs that were statewide, we ignored the sort of city level stuff. Kind of a mess uh, and a lot of work, but, but eventually we could classify a lot of hiring credits. And just, just to give you a sense of, here's the entire time series of hiring credits. This is just the number of programs um, enacted. So some of, these, some of these are expired or repealed. And you can see that, that uh, in, this, well, in this sample period, 147 different hiring credits get passed by, the, by four, as it turned out, 45 of the 50 states. Um, and you can see sort of a flurry of activity. I mean, there's a lot here, um, but there's also a lot um, during the Great Recession and after the Great Recession. So there's actually a lot of policy action going on here. Um, I'll skip that. We estimate a, statistic, uh, a seminar in this paper. We estimate sort of a, a, you know, a fairly standard panel data model with the right distributed lags and lots of controls for all kinds of other things that go on at the state level to try to estimate the effects of particular kind of hiring credits. We look at about 15 different kinds. This table just highlights um, the ones that turn out to be most important. Um, and there's two, this, this block here is about hiring credits that, that target ter certain kinds of workers. So past hiring credits, I, did, I should have said this, a lot of the past hiring credits targeted groups like the disabled or the severely disadvantaged or something like that. We don't find any positive effect of those. These are effects on, on job growth, by the way. Um, we look at those that target the unemployed, and they often actually target the long-term unemployed. And you can see some pretty big, what, you, know, you can see some numbers. You don't know if they're big because I haven't told you what these mean. But what do these mean? Um, if, I, if I enact a credit, this, this, zero, zero, this point zero zero eight four means if I enact a, car, a hiring credit targeting the unemployed, then 12 months later, uh, employment is, is 0 0.8 percentage points higher. So that's actually a pretty big effect, right? That's almost a 1% effect uh, on, 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 on jobs, I should say, <laughs> not the employment rate. 
this is a, we're using job counts here. The other thing, the, the other thing that matters a lot is what's called recapture. So what does recapture mean? Um, recapture means if you if you sort of take a credit for creating jobs and you don't create jobs, the state can come get its money back. Now I wish I knew more on exactly how they did that. Right? It's it's a little hard to tell. Um, so whether it's happening in reality or it's the threat of it happening, sort of like speeding tickets, um, for whatever reason, it matters a lot. These recapture provisions make these higher end credits a lot more effective, okay? Which I think is, is this is one of these cases, this is, this is exactly how they're supposed to work, but we'd be skeptical the governments could actually make this work, but uh, they, they seem to. Okay, there's also, a, 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 so that's sort of in, information from state higher end credits. Then we had this, this funny thing that happened um, in, it, it, during the Great Recession, um, uh, there was the ARRA, the Recovery Act, and one of the things it did was let it gave states extra money under TANF, which is our welfare program, right? But it let them use it in different ways, right? And in fact, a lot of states w went out and did massive subsidies for jobs, often 100%, su 50 to 100% subsidies for hiring, and it was it was billions and billions of dollars. They ramped it up very quickly. Um, it's a little hard to tell what the long-term effects are, right? Um, but there's been some research that, tr that tries to study what happened. Um, and um, it's found, I mean, there are a few things. Uh, so the subsidies, first of all, were very big. The w one thing these credits did, in contrast to past credits, is very broad targeting. Even though this was coming through the TANF program, the welfare program, the states were able to say anyone with, in, with whose family income is, let's say, below 200% of the poverty line is eligible. Well, that's a pretty broad that's a pretty broad spectrum of the population. Um, so they weren't very narrowly targeted. Was it all windfalls? Were firms getting money for doing hiring they would have done anyways? Very hard to tell. Um, there are some surveys of employers which suggest not. Um, and this is just a bunch of, I'll just talk about this very quickly. These are a bunch of, a bunch of little bits of evidence um, where people, w one thing we knew is the take up was, was massive. I mean, I mean, a lot of people were placed in these jobs very quickly. Um, but there's actually also some evidence um, that these jobs had lasting effects, right? That actually, you were not only employed while you got the subsidy, which isn't magic. If you go to a firm and say, I'll subsidize your wage 100%, you know, you'd expect some hiring to occur. Um, but there was some persistence, and there was some persistence concentrated on the long-term unemployed. So it did seem to help um, the target population. Um, this this work, uh, person, Elizabeth Lower Bash, has, has looked at this in a lot of detail. She's kind of got a very institutional perspective on these things, really goes inside the black box. How do these policies work? much more than labor economists tend to do, um, and uncovers a, very, a strong discretionary element to these programs, which is, it's not just you announce a subsidy and peop, you know, firms can take it, right? This was actually done through social service agencies that approach specific employers, where for, the main thing is, what, you know, can we place these people in jobs, first of all, because that was the first objective. Get people working, get them off unemployment insurance, et cetera. But the, it seems like the discretionary nature, going to the employers where you thought you'd get the most, the most effect, was actually, was actually pretty effective. Um, I have to say, when, it, when, when you read about these things, I, I have this little unrelated bullet here, unturned internships for the less, dis less advantaged. I don't know what it's like in Hong Kong or China, but in the US, you know, people like you guys who went to college and then went to grad school or are going to grad school, um, uh, at least your friends who aren't getting PhDs probably all worked as unpaid interns for a while. That's how you get a, a good professional job these days. It's, I mean, my daughter you know, has said to me, um, she did it too, and she said, you know, it's so unfair because I could only do this because you would support me, right? If your parents are, you know, middle class, they say, yeah, I'll support you for six months to get an internship, and that turns into jobs. Well, if you're from a poor family, what do you do, right? Um, and, and in some sense, I, I started thinking about these, 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 these kind of massive subsidy programs, 100% subsidies, as something we might think about. It's very hard to get right, but we might think about as providing these kind of opportunities um, for less advantaged people because uh, it's, it seems like employers are very reluctant to hire people until they know a lot more about them than they can learn from interviews and, and all that stuff. Anyway, that's sort of an aside. Okay, so what do we find from that work on hiring credits? Some evidence of success of these, these TANF subsidies um, and of state hiring credits in, in putting people to work, in, in, and especially in getting the long-term unemployed to work. And I think that is news because, again, the earlier research on hiring credits, if you read it, it's very skeptical, kind of waste of money, doesn't do anything, and that kind of stuff. So that's interesting. Okay, so now that's job creation. So, you know, what can government do on the job creation side? Um, there are, I should say, a few people in the U.S. who argue that minimum wages will create employment, right? And the argument there is it's a stimulus, right? I mean, I, I, I don't think, when I debate minimum wage advocates, as I often do, um, I can usually get them to back down from that position pretty quickly, right? 
by saying, well, if that's all we want to do, let's just give them checks, right? That'd be much more. If we're just trying to stimulate the economy, we can do it much more efficiently. But we can, but we can also think about, but now we can turn our gear toward not forgetting about job creation. If you are working, how can we increase your standard of living, right? What do we do to get the, the, the income of working people up to a level that we find acceptable? I have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, what do I got? No, if you're not looking at your watch, I'll just keep talking. No, just okay. <laughs> okay, so what do we know about the EITC, okay? We, we know a few things, and there's a lot of work on this, and it, it's really almost unanimous. Um, proven effective at increasing employment, income, and earnings of single mothers, right? Because they, they, they are the poorest, you know, the poorest adults in our population uh, who get who get pretty big subsidies from the EITC. So the EITC now, for those of you who don't know it, is a 40% subsidy to your earnings, right? The maximum you can get is somewhere between, it's about $5,700 right now. So if you're somebody making $12,000, $13,000, it's a lot of money, right? It's a big, it's a, it's a big benefit from the government. Um, I've done work with Washer where we look at state expansions. It, just, just like with minimum wages in the U.S., during the, 2000, the sort of late 90s and 2000s, we had a huge increase in state earned income tax programs that piggyback on the federal program. So that gives us sort of more compelling information with which to identify the effect of the earned income tax credit. And what you see, which is interesting, this is from, from, from that paper, um, what, I'm, what I'm running here is models for the probability that earnings, not income, so this is labor market earnings, right? This is before you get the check from the government, right? So that earnings are below the poverty line or below half the poverty line, which we call extreme poverty. And the EITC is, if you don't have kids, you get, you get almost nothing from it, a few hundred dollars. Um, and what you see here, I, so, so these, are, these are the models. The EITC kids interactions are, are really the effects of interest, because that's the relative effect of the EITC on pe people with kids, because they're the ones who get a lot from it. And negative here means a lower probability the earnings are below the poverty line. And, what you, and these are different groups, families, single family, he female heads, less educated, minority. And you can see the, these, these, well, there's not much going on in this column, which we would expect, because these are not low-income families. These are, the other three are low-income families on average. Um, negatives here, not significant. And once we do extreme poverty, significant negative effects, significantly lower probability that your earnings are below sort of an extremely low level. And what that means is the EITC, even before you take account of the money you're going to get, the check you get from the government, you're more likely to earn your way out of extreme poverty and perhaps out of poverty as well. Right? So that's a pretty amazing program, right? You know, we, we don't have any programs that work like that. We can obviously lift people out of poverty by giving them money, and we do that too, right? Um, but this is a really effective program, and it comes about because it has a big effect on the extensive margin for these women, right? The EITC really brings single women with kids into the labor market, okay? Now, the big policy question right now, the president is, working, is, is pushing this hard, is to expand the EITC for those who don't have eligible children. So as I said, you get around 5,700 right now if you have two kids, less with one kid. With no kids, you get something like $700. So it's, it's irrelevant, right? It's the same. We can think about it as zero. Um, so, so what's the argument? Well, one is we've had declining wages for low-skilled men. We all know about that, right? So this is meant to help rectify that. Also, obviously, the same argument for raising the minimum wage. A bunch of benefits are conjectured. You know, if you get people to work more, you'll, you'll increase their experience and therefore future wages. So an EITC will encourage some of these guys to work. Um, uh, Low-skilled men have become very unattractive marriage partners, right? Um, partly because of their low earnings. That's a conjecture. Um, you know, illicit activity is relatively more attractive when your labor market opportunities are so low. So this is kind of the perspective, comes from the perspective which I share, that the, the labor market in the U.S. and everywhere probably has really shifted against low-skilled people. They just can't earn what they used to. And there's probably nothing we can do to change that in terms of what the market delivers, right? So do we need to think about other ways to get these people more money? And in the U.S. at least, we're probably not going to just give them checks. It's going to be in work. So that's, I think, why this has become a popular policy proposal. Can we, can we improve the situation of these people by basically raising the ITC for them? What do we know about this? Not much. There was this program run in Milwaukee called New Hope, which wasn't really an EITC, but it was an employment subsidy for men and for men without kids. It's the, it was a, actually an experiment. Um, and, actually, and that program actually shows increased employment earnings and family income uh, among men right? When, when you ran a program like this. There is a potential trade-off, however. right? If, I, if, I, if, I, if we put in place a more aggressive EITC for people without kids, we're going to increase their labor supply, presumably. Not necessarily, but presumably. And they're going to compete with the other people who are trying to help. 
right? So if we, if we most want to help the women with kids, the poor women with kids, and now we encourage other people to enter the labor market, well, what's going to happen to their wages, right? So, you know, economists are fond of pointing out these trade-offs, but they're real. Do we know what will happen? Well, we don't really because we don't have a childless EITC, but we can run the experiment in the other direction. We can ask what happens to low-skilled, um, this is childless individuals, less educated, less educated minority, less educated single minority. What happens to them when the EITC gets more generous? Okay? And there's very consistent evidence here. Um, uh, well, the wage effects are negative, not significant. Their employment declines and their earnings decline pretty substantially. So at least in the other direction, there does appear to be competition in the labor market between the people who currently get a lot out of the EITC and the people who might get a lot if we expanded the EITC for the childless. That doesn't mean we don't want to do it, right? It just means it's not necessarily a free lunch. Now, this, may not, this is just another piece of evidence. I'll skip that one. Um, that may not be what happens, right? Because if the, if, the, if, the, you know, if, the, if the adjustment is on the extensive margin, we know for single women the adjustment is on the extensive margin. So we raise the EITC, women enter the labor market, they push down wages of low-skilled guys. What will be the adjustment for low-skilled males without kids? Well, may, you know, it might be that the adjustment is mainly on the intensive margin. And what's the adjustment on the intensive margin to a more generous EITC? It's to work less, presumably, right? There's a negative income effect on hours. So you could actually, you're, in principle, you could get a reduction in the labor supply. We don't know. But if you get a big extensive margin reaction from single men, and you might because their employment rates are very low, um, then you're going to face, the, the, face this trade-off. So those are some of the things we'd like to know. Do we know anything about those conjectured effects? Um, you know, if we raise their wages, will more of them get married, fewer out of wedlock childbirths, blah, blah, blah. Um, the previous version of this paper a few months ago said no. Um, but David Otter and, and a couple other people have a very interesting paper. It's a follow-up to their AAR paper on, on imports from China. Um, where they actually, so they're basically using local labor market shocks based on manufacturing employment that competes with Chinese imports. And, um, uh, and they actually find, to my amazement, and I think theirs, that these negative shocks to sort of male-dominated industries actually are associated with family structure, right? So when, when, when males really took it on the chin in terms of the labor market, there is less marriage, there is more out of wedlock childbearing and all that. So maybe there's something to this. My assessment is this is probably a policy worth trying. There's enough, there's enough evidence and enough of a problem we should try it, um, but we do need to worry about the groups they compete with. Okay, should we make it more generous for everyone? That's another, uh, another option, of course. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's the best program we have. I, 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 I like the EITC a lot more than the minimum wage. Um, I'll talk about why in a minute, um, and I'll skip the rest of that. Okay, so what are the minimum wage? Since I have five minutes left. Um, so, you know, I think my views on the employment effects of minimum wage have been written down enough times um, that I'm not going to really rehash them here. I just want to touch on two points, and this is really by way of, if you want to read more, here's what you should go read. Um, there's been a recent exchange. There were these two papers by combinations of these authors, Allegretta Dubé, Lester, and Reich. We have a paper just came out in the ILR that takes strong issue. They, they claim, and John is going to talk about some of this work, um, or at least work related to it, they claim that when you do things beyond the standard panel data estimator, you don't get employment effects to the minimum wage, uh, especially for teens. That's, I think, the more relevant evidence. Um, uh, we have the, 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 this 2014 paper really takes, takes issue with that. We actually have some, some work in progress. This is one of these minimum wage, like it's a never-ending debate. So they have a comment on our paper. We have a paper going back and looking at them. Um, I just want to put up one slide, which, which John hasn't seen because we haven't circulated the paper yet. Um, um, but basically, this red line here is, um, these are zero. This is, what, this is state level panel data. This is when the minimum wage goes up. These are leads. These are lags. Okay? So the red line here is sort of what you get on up to 12 quarters of leads of minimum wage effects. And the red line out here is what you get after the minimum wage goes up. And you can see the sort of bouncing around zero here, and then the sort of a distinct downward shift. Not, not permanent, but temporary for a couple of years after the minimum wage goes up. Um, these guys claim that, that when, they, when they estimate a model which is much more saturated, um, that those effects look much different. Um, we've actually been working on it, and, and we literally can't replicate it, and, and uh, tried very hard. So much so that I, I didn't believe what one of my co-authors was getting. So he said, let's give the other co-author the data and none of your programs. Because if you read someone else's programs, you just make the same mistake. And, you know, and exactly the same result. So, so I have a feeling this whole, this whole debate is a little overblown, but we'll see where that goes. Um, 
Um, I also think that there, there's one other point that is, that is surfacing a lot in the minimum wage debate these days, and that is that es oh, the estimates are centered on zero. And this is what, what this, this guy, John Schmidt, who's a, who's a, who works for a group that advocates for, for higher minimum wages, he keeps re reproducing this graph, which is from a, a meta-analysis by these guys. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I know how to pronounce his name. Um, and you look at this graph and you say, boy, minimum wage effects are really centered on zero, aren't they? Well, then you look at this graph a little harder and you say, well, wait a second. Okay. First of all, this vertical axis goes up to 350. This is one over the standard error, right? There aren't a lot of minimum wage studies with t-statistics greater than three, so I don't know what these studies are, it, right? And the elasticity goes from minus 20 to five, right? And the debate used to be about is it zero to minus 0.4. In our, in our big survey, we said there's estimates between zero and minus one. So, you know, quite obviously, if I, if, I, if I look at this part of the graph, what does it look like? This line, it turns out, is actually centered at minus 0.19 elasticity, right? Which is kind of what I've always maintained is where, where most evidence points. Um, so I think this claim that, the, you know, what the literature as a whole says is no effects is bogus. That doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't tell you which studies are right and which studies are wrong, um, but I think it's important. Um, uh, all that implies, though, I, I, I am quite convinced minimum wages reduce employment. That, that says there's some job loss. That doesn't mean minimum wages are a bad idea, right? You can still, on average, help low-income people, okay? So I'm going to uh, close very quickly. This is a cartoon from, I had a Wall Street Journal op-ed. I, I couldn't believe they put a cartoon in because they rarely do. And you can see what's going on here. The president, you recognize that guy, is throwing, it came out a little blurry, is throwing paper airplane $100 bills at families, and these are the poor guys. Right, and these are the non-poor ones. Now they got it slightly wrong because these guys actually should be getting some of the money, but the but the point is, it's not all going to them, right? Minimum wages go. A lot of minimum wage benefits go to poor, go to non-poor families. If you simulate increasing the, the 1010 minimum wage, what's the president's proposing, right? 18% um, of the benefits would go to poor families, right? 29% would go to families more than three times um, median income. It's pretty poor targeting. If you talked about 15, what the fast food workers want, of course, it gets even worse, right? Because now it's only 12% going to poor families. So the, the thing about the minimum wage I think we have to keep in mind, and this is be above and beyond the employment effects debate. I mean, there's no disemployment effects, then it's, it's got to help, right? You give, I mean, you're, you're, you're creating money out of nothing, right? But as long as there's some disemployment effects, um, there's some trade-offs, and then you have to ask, well, is the trade-off worth it? Is the policy efficient? And the problem is it's incredibly inefficient, right? why we target low-wage workers, not low-income families. The problem we're worried about is not low-wage workers, it's low-income families, okay? Um, and, you know, and to make it worse, who pays for the minimum wage? Well, not the richest, right? I don't know, I don't know how it would work in China, but in the U.S., um, presumably, those who, who most pay the minimum wage are going to be small business owners, right? It's not the Walmarts of the world, they're already paying much higher, they're paying low wages, but they're above minimum wage. Um, it's the small business owners. Now, are they rich? Some of them, right? But many of them aren't, right? So, so the minimum wage is this very strange redistributive policy where we take money from, you know, the middle to upper middle, maybe sometimes even the lower middle, and we give it to people who probably earn a little less on average, right? But it's not, it, you know, if we want to deal with inequality, we want to transfer from the top to the bottom, right? And we have ways of doing that. It's called taxes and transfers. And it's far more effective than doing it through the minimum wage. So I think that makes it quite difficult um, to make, plus these kind of numbers, uh, to make the case that it's the right response to inequality. Yes. That are targeted to help uh, low income and low skill workers. Um, David gave us a, a summary of a number of programs, uh, including hiring credits, EITC, and minimum wage. And um, I find myself in agreement with most of what David said about uh, EITC and minimum wage. So I, I, I think I'll just uh, focus on, on, the, on the hiring credits. Uh, one of the things I like about uh, the analysis of the hiring tech credits is that he, um, he puts into context that uh, the different policies may have different effects in different phases of business cycle. So this is hiring credits are demand-based policies, uh, which according to standard microeconomic theory, we don't really care whether we're subsidizing the employers and employees, but in, in times of uh, like the Great Recession where there probably is some wage rigidity, there is a conceptual difference between subsidizing employers to create jobs and subsidize versus subsidizing workers to join the labor market. So I, I find that uh, uh, perspective quite interesting. Um, to be sure, David also mentioned some of the standard criticism of, uh, in particular of uh, hiring credits. 
um, one of the one of the more important uh, things that economists have pointed out in the past is that hiring credits are a very blunt instrument. It's kind of like uh, the cartoon that David just put up. It's, it's subsidizing a lot of companies that are hiring anyway. Um, so the, the way I read the, the literature is not really that economists are criticizing that hiring credits are not effective, but rather most economists, at least before this generation of new research on hiring credits, were, were criticizing hiring credits for for the fact that they are not cost effective. It's very expensive uh, per job created. Um, and I'll come back to this later. Um, so the, the, the evidence examined by David um, uses a panel data set of uh, state employment levels controlling for a number of things. Um, the empirical strategy is to compare states employment growth in, in places with some kind of those programs versus states without those programs. Um, the sort of my broad impression after reading the paper and the statistical evidence is that there, there are two, two main findings. Number one is that if you, don't, if you don't make any distinction between the different program features, just, just look at states with those programs compared to states without uh, or time periods, state time. Uh, there is no there's not really any substantial positive evidence that they work. Um, but finding number two is that if we look at the programs in a little more detail and try to distinguish uh, programs with certain features, uh, David identified two types of quote unquote winners. These are programs that seem to work. Number one is programs with recapture. Um, and number two is programs that are targeted at the unemployed. Okay. Um, the, I, I was a, a little bit, uh, I was less enthusiastic about the, the, I think I find myself less enthusiastic about the, the finding um, than David is because I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about several things. Number one is that the, the sample size is fairly small. Uh, the, 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 I, I, don't, I don't know if I read the, pay, the tables correctly, but if, I, but if I read it correctly, it seems like there are only four programs with this recapture feature. And there were um, um, four programs with, uh, which were targeted at the unemployed. Um, so, so and, and at the same time, the paper also identified a lot of quote unquote losers, which don't seem to work. So there's kind of very mixed evidence, and I'm not sure if we can come arrive at the conclusion today that uh, the, those, those guys with statistical T larger than two are the winners, and those guys with T less than two are the losers. So I, I think a, a lot of work had to be done. And on that, I, I think I, I should uh, give credit to David, because I think the, the fact that he was one of the first to come up with the idea that, look, the recent years, there were actually a lot of these hiring credits um, is providing us with a lot of research because the, the, the research on new job uh, tax credit basically died out 20 years ago. And now we suddenly have people who had the persistence to bring this back to the academic literature and also done a lot of groundwork on collecting the data on different, uh, on, on all the so dirty work about the legal aspects and the different policies. So I, I think it's, it's going to pr be proved to be a fruitful area for, for future research. And uh, um, um, the, the, the thing I worry about is, again, related to the empirical strategy, which is that unlike EITC and minimum wage, which were characterized by a few parameters, the job hiring credits are, are plagued by a tremendous degree of heterogeneity. The way the program is run, how enthusiastic the local officials are, how generous is the funding, whether they are bundled with or without uh, some other policies. So there's, there's a whole lot of these kind of uh, heterogeneity that may cause different programs to be effective or ineffective. So I, it, it, it could be a challenge to try to tease out uh, these things. But uh, I, I think David had give a, given us some, some stimulus to kind of really look harder into this area. So that, that's uh, all I want to say.
done in, uh, by David and colleagues Salas and Washer, and uh, a new paper also the same vintage basically by Mir and West. And what I'm basically going to do is to examine this new literature, which uh, uh, is I put in the context of the new, new minimum wage uh, literature, um, and uh, to see the sensitivity of our results uh, to the criticisms uh, uh, entered by David and by Amir and West. Although we are, uh, if you like, bit players in this controversy, uh, because our research initially uh, published in 2012 was conducted independently of work by Juby, Lester, and Reich, uh, but reaches some fairly similar uh, conclusions, but much less strident. Um, and uh, this has been criticized in a very important piece uh, by, by, by David, published, sub I've called it 2013, but it was actually published in the May issue of the uh, 2014 ILRR. Uh, but I'll stick with it because he may have removed the quote uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the ILRR paper that I want to end my lecture with. Uh, and so I can actually give chapter and verse on that. Miriam West is uh, a new, uh, uh, rather different uh, set of uh, papers. But what we found is sort of typical in this, uh, uh, if you like, in this new, new minimum wage literature. Um, we're looking at uh, an archetypal uh, low-wage sector, which is NAICS 722, which we call a restaurant and bars, a little bit informally. And this is uh, an archetypal uh, minimum wage sector, or low wage sector, in that it has the highest percentage of workers at or below the minimum wage. And uh, we basically uh, augment uh, the basic two-step model with a geographic specific trend, as in fact a county specific linear trend. And uh, we find uh, that the findings from the basic two-step model um, were biased towards finding a negative employment effect of minimum wages, basically because minimum wages are increased most or are increased in, uh, in those sectors which are tending to exhibit down long, uh, downward long-term trends in, uh, in employment. So David has criticized this research, and as have Mir and West. Um, and the two critiques, David's and Mir and West critiques, either build upon the finding that when you do allow for geographic specific uh, a, a linear trends, the negative effects of minimum wages do not disappear. Um, and in, uh, as, as, is, as we report, let's say, for this restaurant and bar sector. And uh, the Mir and West argument is that uh, if the minimum wage effects, uh, negative minimum wage, significant minimum wage effects do disappear, it's because of employment uh, dynamics. The wider backdrop to the study is a new meta-analysis of around 27, uh, exactly 27 modern studies of the impact of minimum wages um, um, by Wolfson and Bellman, uh, which basically argues uh, that there is no economic uh, or a statistically uh, consistently significant uh, relationship uh, between minimum wages and, uh, and uh, employment of low-wage workers. I certainly don't want to go along with that conclusion, but I'm basically looking at the sensitivity of the results we reported in 2012 uh, to the criticisms, very interesting criticisms, uh, made by David and uh, others. And I find this a learning experience. For example, uh, I found it extremely useful, uh, the idea that one should be very careful in running regressions uh, to take account of, uh, if you like, recessions. I'll elaborate on this. 
but the basic idea is that you would expect to find more adverse effects of minimum wage increases during recessions than outside of recessions. Now, although we don't actually find that, we do find in a paper in Labor Economics in 2013, uh, we do find that uh, there are bigger minimum negative, uh, there are more adverse uh, negative employment effects of minimum wages in high uh, unemployment areas. So it is very similar, and we learned uh, from that criticism. And in running this paper and writing this paper for this conference, we were uh, basically hoping, uh, to, we were hoping to learn more uh, about what might have been driving our results. OK. Um, there are basically two approaches to geographic variation in this new, new uh, minimum wage research. And I've isolated as exemplars of these two, either the geographic specific linear, linear trend, or if you like the case study approach writ large using larger panels, let's call it a border county approach. Uh, I've attributed that to Juby Lest and Reich. Uh, this was published in the Review of Economics and Statistics. This was published in Industrial Relations. And I take these as the exemplars rather than our own work, say here, because they are the most strident uh, representatives of the argument that minimum wages don't cost jobs. We've always been very cautious in, 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 in making that uh, inference and making sure that our observations are not taken uh, beyond the context that we're looking at. Um, the outcome of this criticism, either this case study approach, you know, um, this is basically the difference in difference model, Pennsylvania um, and New Jersey experiment, but to uh, apply it, if you like, to all contiguous uh, uh, counties uh, in the United States. Uh, David would criticize the, the number of counties that are actually being examined. Uh, this basic approach came out with this uh, uh, outcome. And that is that minimum wages uh, do not have statistically significant effects on uh, unemployment, um, although they do have uh, statistically significant effects on earnings. OK. I'm not going to say much about the cross-border model because we've criticized it fairly uh, heavily in our originally 2012 paper. I haven't got time to go into the criticism, but uh, I'm very suspicious of it. However, uh, there is, if you like, uh, some perhaps some catharsis going on uh, with uh, the uh, uh, construction of uh, synthetic counterfactuals and whether these are really localized as, as UB, Lester, and Reich would have us believe or whether they can be drawn uh, more widely and uh, with less saturated uh, models. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on that at all because I don't like it very much. And I'm going to be looking at the limitations of the state. The paper is looking at the limitations of the state panel model uh, with state or county-specific uh, linear trends. Uh, there is some link, as I said, uh, between, uh, between the, the two. Uh, and that's uh, basically because of uh, these synthetic control estimators uh, associated with replacing, if you like, census division time period interactions uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the paper. Uh, if you like, uh, by uh, the, the, the people in uh, uh, Allegretto, Duby, and, and, and Reich. OK. Um, so let me just then uh, continue, if I may, um, with the issues that David uh, and colleagues uh, criticize these uh, specific uh, geographic linear trend uh, uh, models. Basically, those are the criticisms uh, and recommendations that uh, David uh, and colleagues make. 
I think you can read them as well as I can, can say them. And basically, when they, if you like, use higher order trends, exclusions of subperiods of steep recessions in estimating those state level trends while retaining the whole sample period, or when they use uh, a Hudrick Prescott filter to detrend the data, they come up with, if you like, uh, significant. Uh, effects of minimum wages, negative effects of minimum wages on employment. Uh, my apologies for the error here, uh, 2011. And uh, that is the finding when uh, David's uh, cr uh, criticisms of the use of this linear trend model are taken into account. And this is what we have to deal with. The criticism of Mir and West is rather different. Um, basically, they say that all that, what's really going on here is a question of employment dynamics. And the pro in the process, the uh, effect of minimum wages on employment levels is attenuated. And this is the basic reason. Uh, any post-treatment deviation in employment growth caused by the treatment will attenuate an estimated static treatment effect if the specification includes a single trend for the pre- and post-treatment periods. And that is basically their criticism, and that's basically their reason uh, for, uh, if you like, uh, excluding, uh, excluding uh, 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 the use of, uh, of, of uh, this linear trend. They basically argue that the effect of minimum wages will be upon employment growth rather than employment levels, even if the cumulative effect of uh, uh, reduced employment growth uh, after some years is uh, a sufficiently long time is substantive. But it's not going to be picked up. Um, they basically report that a 10% increase in the minimum wage uh, uh, reduces the rate of job growth by approximately one quarter in the first year following uh, the implementation of the minimum wage. And of course, the context uh, is uh, in the popularization of this argu arg argument, the 40% increase in the minimum wage proposed by the Obama administration. All right, so how destructive are these criticisms uh, by David and uh, Mirren West of the use of, sorry, I've overshot. Uh, how destructive are they of the, uh, the, the basic finding that uh, this uh, term is, uh, uh, the inclusion of this term makes the, renders the coefficient estimate phi on the log minimum wage uh, uh, statistically, uh, basically statistically insignificant. Um, when you adopt, basically, uh, uh, you take account of the criticisms made of this approach by David and colleagues and Miriam West. OK. Now, we're uh, basically. Uh, arguing in the original paper here using data from the uh, qu uh, quarterly census of employment wages estimates over the period 1990-2005, uh, that basically if you run the equation without this, you get highly significant, well, you get significant coefficient estimates on the minimum wage, but when you introduce that, uh, this becomes statistically insignificant. So, what we've got to do uh, according to David and colleagues, is basically allow the uh, state-specific trends to be of a higher order than linear. And this is basically what happens when we uh, use uh, higher or order terms. Uh, last four columns. First of all, we run the model with no trends. We have a significantly negative effect. Uh, no county-specific uh, 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 trend variable. In there, we get the significantly negative effect 
uh, this is the elasticity, of course, uh, uh, when we basically introduce the uh, linear trend, it disappears, or the significance disappears. And when we introduce the higher order terms, we do actually find two significant uh, coefficient estimates. So that's rather interesting. Although, if you look at those, uh, this is highly significant. This is only marginally significant. But this is uh, what we were, were warned, uh, warned about. So summarizing that, in these two instances, uh, we have estimated minimum wage effects that are significant. The other coefficients are little affected by polynomial detrending, other than this effect uh, on unemployment, which changes to positive and significant, which is perverse. Uh, but let's just say these are decidedly mixed, effect, uh, mixed uh, results. Uh, but the main point, I think, that we're dealing with, and this is something we have to be very careful of as well later on, is that the minimum wage elasticities are, are modest. Notice the dis difference between here and here and here. Uh, all right. Now, uh, the, one of the other suggestions uh, that uh, uh, David and colleagues make is that we should exclude periods of steep recessions in estimating state level trends while retaining the whole sample period uh, to estimate minimum wage effects and also the use of a Hodrick Prescott filter to detrend de the data. So here we've got the estimates of the minimum wage elasticity, summary estimates using post-1993 trends, leaving out the recession, and then peak-to-peak -peak trends, and then the Hodrick Prescott filter, uh, which yields a, uh, a small uh, uh, statistically significant coefficient estimate. So uh, it doesn't look, at least in, uh, for our sample period, which in Addison uh, and uh, Blackburn and Corti 2012, was um, as shown here from 1990 to 2005, it doesn't look uh, as if that were, uh, it, it, that worked, um, if you like, too well. Uh, just summarizing. So only the Hodrick Prescott filter produces a marginally significant effect, S similar elasticity as in the previous case. Um, I'm no expert on, on, on the uh, Hodrick uh, Prescott filter, uh, but I am familiar with the criticism of it that it is a mechanical, uh, rather mecha of a rather mechanical nature, uh, with the filter tending to find s cycles in the data uh, when the cycles are not present. And uh, uh, I'd refer you to the work of Cogley and Nason. 1995 in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. But I don't want to make that as a cheap shot. I'm just a little bit worried, as a lot of economists are, labor economists are, with these procedures. But David should come back and say, well, why don't you estimate it over a period that we were looking at, too? And so what we have here is that we extended the data as far as we possibly could, which is more or less the same uh, as uh, 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 David's period and we repeat the previous two tables. So here we have higher order, uh, uh, we have polynomials, we have no trends, we have a, a, a simple uh, linear trend, and uh, we then use these other detrending methods, uh, post-1993 trends, peak-to-peak -peak trends, and then the HP filter, and we run the things again, and what do we find? Uh, we find slightly weaker results, actually, than in, in the first case. Uh, this is uh, no trends is no longer significant. There is uh, there are uh, a s interesting, a significant result of, again, small elasticity uh, for the minimum wage as a, uh, you know, the simple linear trend. And this third order polynomial, uh, we also get uh, and elasticity of, uh, of much the same uh, of much the same order. 
no re significant results here uh, other than uh, for the Hodrick Prescott filter. So, summarizing. Um, again, we get, uh, we get slightly weaker results, of course, for the, uh, as I said, uh, in this extended period than we did earlier for the uh, polynomials. Uh, but uh, we do get the same again, very similar result uh, um, for the Hodrick Prescott filter. But uh, I think it's important to recognize that we are seeing some effects here. And uh, th this is part of a, a learning process uh, that I am prepared to, to, uh, to work on further. Now let's get on to the Mir and West application. Uh, some preliminaries first. Um, we basically consider the Mir and West criticism an argument that minimum wages may have lagged responses. But we see no reason uh, to get rid of uh, a statistically significant variable such as uh, the linear uh, geographic specific linear trends for two reasons. There's no collinearity problem in our data. And minimum wages, secondly, are not causing a fall uh, in the trend in employment growth uh, in uh, areas raising the minimum wage. And the, the evidence is to the contrary. So we uh, have that criticism. The basic equation they use is a rate of change in employment. Uh, they difference employment and they teach all the right-hand side variables in levels. This basic equation is hard uh, to defend. It is fairly uh, common these days as a first approximation to a fully dynamic specification, uh, but we are, if you like, much happier to recast the, uh, the model in terms of a fully differenced uh, equation. And so what happens when we run their model uh, their basic model. Let me just uh, show you the results. We are basically introducing um, up to a six-year lag here. So the sample period goes from 1990-2012 to 1996-2012. to And these are, this is the differencing, one quarter, one year, four years, six years. And this is uh, where the uh, uh, this is where the uh, um, uh, let me just make sure this is where we have uh, the dependent variable uh, is difference, but the other variables are not differenced in the first two columns, and this is where uh, everything is differenced. Our preferred specifications in the last four columns of the table. And as you, you can see, nothing much is going on there. So uh, what we are basically uh, uh, concluding is, uh, and we've got some slight changes in specification from our original, uh, because these guys are using, uh, uh, these guys are using uh, uh, census division. They're using region time interactions. Uh, and so we, we have to, for uh, purposes of comparison, we didn't have those in our original. And we can't find much support, therefore, uh, for uh, the idea that the effect of minimum wages, uh, uh, we don't find much support for the notion that lagged uh, minimum wage effects are a matter of concern. Um, there's my, basically my summary. So having played the game, uh, what are we to conclude? I think if you read uh, David's paper in the ILRR, and you also look at the statement of research by uh, Allegretto, Juby, and Reich, there are actually some, uh, there are actually some commonalities here. And that is 
in the selection of counterfactuals? What should we be looking for? Should we be looking for uh, synthetic controls or should we, and if we use synthetic controls, uh, do they actually um, speak against localized controls such as county-specific uh, trends uh, in favor of a, uh, a, a wider uh, uh, comparison or uh, are, they, are they addressing localized uh, concerns after all? Um, so I, I think there's some commonality there in the research agenda. What should be the research agenda in terms of, if you like, the counterfactuals? Uh, now this paper you might find a little defensive um, because uh, um, it is responding to criticism and in the literature there is a great tradition of looking at uh, criticism, sometimes misstating what they're being criticized for in order to get the result they desire. And uh, I, I, I want to assure you that we have treated this at all times as a learning experience, to take criticism seriously and to see whether these results do disappear when you take account of, of them. And we would say there's some evidence that they uh, some modest evidence that they uh, are, are, are certainly sensitive, but uh, I think the overriding conclusion is that in this sector, um, uh, restaurant and bars, uh, the elasticities are, uh, if you like, uh, low and often insignificant. And in David's paper, uh, uh, this was the Itza version, I think, it's just that wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. We were, uh, you know, and we... we John Addison was right. <laughs> no, 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 I doubt it says that, David. <laughs> but I think if we, um, if we take criticism honestly and seriously, uh, there is a way forward in this. And so how would I interpret my evidence? Well, I interpret my evidence, our evidence, if you like, in the context of a competitive model, frankly, in which elasticities are extremely low and where typically minimum wage increases have been uh, modest. And some support, uh, I adduce some support for that because when the minimum wage increases have been larger, uh, there is this tendency to see larger effects in if not in recession, but areas of higher uh, unemployment. And also the cross-country evidence is very strongly in support of David's conjecture about recession. And I've done some of that work uh, too. Um, so how do I interpret my evidence? Well, I would hope that it would stimulate research into the effects of minimum wages on a number of, uh, in a number of areas. For example, my data set can't, has got no information on hours whatsoever. And this is critical. And some of your work has shown that hours are reduced in these circumstances, even if employment isn't. This is very important for some of the themes we were talking about earlier this morning. So I'd like to see work on hours, more work on hours. I'd like to see more, more work on training and non-wage benefits. And here I'd like you to consider also adjustments along some other margins. There's a very interesting paper by Barry Hirsch with uh, uh, Bruce Kaufman and I think Zelenka, uh, which is coming out any day in industrial relations, which looks at adjustments of prices, profits, turnover, and performance standards. You know, the word performance standards getting the guys to work harder when the minimum wage goes up. So why don't we observe more dramatic? Uh, uh, my, my argument is would be, why don't we observe more dramatic effects on the employment aggregate? And I think there are some hints to this uh, in these other adjustments that are being made. And I'm also very much in favor of research along the Mir and West lines about the importance of dynamics. And in particular, what is the effect of minimum wages, not so much on survival rates of firms, but on birth rates of firms? And here I'd like to uh, 
to plug some work of uh, my best PhD student, Pedro Portugal, at the Bank of Portugal with Ana Ruth uh, Cardozo. Uh, and uh, they have been looking at those sort of things. And those are the things that I am uh, led uh, to believe is important. So if I've learned something from Mir and West, I think it's, uh, it's redirected me towards that line of research. And uh, if I've learned something from the criticism uh, uh, of, um, it, was, it wasn't so much directed at, at, at us, but we were accused of sophistry at one point. Uh, if I've learned something from that, uh, that is, apply the methods, see what you get, and does it modify your previous conclusions? And if not, why not? And my attitude would be uh, always uh, towards favoring, unlike Mir and West, not a labor market imperfections approach, uh, uh, but uh, um, working in terms of a competitive model. As I said, the original paper was uh, was couched entirely in terms of a, compet of a competitive uh, model on which minimum wages intruded. So I think our results still largely stand, but uh, I'm conscious of uh, much more work is necessary. And to quote David, uh, minimum wages is uh, a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, in terms of research, and I think the, it's more open now than it's that's been. For, yes, thank you. The project is supported by Fabian Six. The project started from 2011. We have been doing this project for almost two years, more than two years. We finish some drugs and all the papers for so this is not a complete paper. This is a more I think important to the progress of our project. So this I know we have two projects. We will present the papers more specific on the effect of the policy on the labor market. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> so I will talk about you know, five, yeah, four issues. Uh, first, the just the introduction, the evaluation of the policy. <coughs> yeah, in the last uh, then just uh, summarize some main findings from the list of the the international uh, research. The third issue is about the enforcement of the minimum wage policies. I think that is very important in developing countries like China. So now uh, I will show you how enforcement improved over time. The fourth issue is uh, we just uh, uh, have done some analysis by using the new methods that is for an employee the matching method. So from that data, we produce some preliminary results and then we hope results for the charge issue. In the last three years. Uh, so that is the structure of my presentations. Uh, uh, perhaps some of the experts in the audience know 
the policy, the minimum value recommendations was introduced the previous month. Uh, in the 1994, that was more likely the public policy. It's a new sum policy. It's not a national policy. So when the policy was introduced, much the add the pressure of the new convention on the such as I know, because uh, China, the joint is international churches, we should have such policy. Uh, so that means from the two, uh, 1994 to the, the 2000, the policy was not paid seriously uh, by the, the government. So that is policy. But nobody cared about the policy. So, there is that time. But uh, in <coughs> 2003, the central government yeah, introduced this uh, policy, the regulation that it was implemented the national in the March of 2004. Uh, the regulations is tiny. The covered all the employees in the urban areas, including those in the small business, in the former sectors, like the rural mining. Uh, but there are no <coughs> the national, the minimum of standards in China. You see, the process is that. Uh, the central government just uh, mandated the provincial government to have implement such a policy. Uh, so the minimum standards are determined by the provincial government. They just set up the different standards for the city government to choose. There are some negotiations between the city government Government, yeah, um, the choosing the standards. So the local government uh, is required to readjust the standard every two years. Yeah, at least. <coughs> so that means the city government uh, has no duties to implement the regulation. So that will be the large deviation in terms of the minimum standards across the region and across the cities. And you will find the minimum wage, average minimum wage in different provinces in 2012. You can see large variations. The highest in the Shanghai is almost 90% the high. You have no problem. Do you have a graph what that looks like relative to averages, average provincial wages? Uh, yes, it has several considerations when the provincial set up the uh, ways to keep people with average wage, another is the financial capability, the physical capability. So, that because uh, the minimum wage standards said that it decided by local, there have been increasing significantly in many provinces in the last few years. For instance, the Sichuan province increased the minimum wage by 22 percent, and Gansu increased by 28 percent in the So up to now, we are more than 20 provinces which have increased in the wage in the last few years. So if you look at the minimum wage increase between the 2011 and the 2012 in some provinces, you see some provinces have to keep the same minimum wage as before, but some provinces have to see a big increase, like the kind of 
some findings from the Swain uh, at all estimate whether we know the policy the impact of working on the time. Uh, we found that increasingly wet will have an impact of reducing the work hours for China. Uh, but uh, it's more effect on the rural labor force uh, than on the urban force. Uh, so all have more impact on the female work, particularly the female migrants. So, uh, but uh, you haven't found any consistent result for the severe, severe over effect. So, what else? So, I have another study from the uh, increased mean wage will increase the males, the workers, and particularly the works in the East areas. And we will reduce the workers of work in the West End, but have no significant impact on the work in the section. That's in the findings. So, but you see, different studies, different studies, we get the difference in the I think, uh, <coughs> why a so large difference in the I think that is not to come to so that means we suppose people have policy, but policy is not, not efficient, supplementary, is not fully enforced. Call the policy kind of thing. So I think the yeah, <coughs> enforcement. Of the policy is very important. Just as I mentioned at the beginning, the government gives the policies. Government did not have a lot of for the implementation of the policies. Uh, just at that time, the central government and the local government were worried about the negative impact on the so, but uh, since uh, 2006 or 2008, uh, there are some changes in the attitude of the central government. Also, the change in the behavior of the local government uh, to accept the policy or implement the policy. So, for the local government, the absolute jet from more resistance to reluctance or to more <coughs> compliance. So now I will divide you see, the period, the end of the policy, into two phases. The first is 1994, <coughs> Why uh, we yeah, think that is the first phase uh, of the yeah, kind of that. Uh, you see, during this phase, you see, the policy of minimum wage has been set at the moment. I will show you that. And the decline as a percentage of the average wage over time achieved in 2009. Also, the local government had no strong motivation to implement the regulations. So, the enforcement was a big problem. Uh, if you like, if you look at the growth of the average wage and the growth of the average mean wage, you will find a big difference. Everywhere. 
我曾爆发死，我热爱你，你怎么回事 ？But the turning point is two thousand nine. 哎 ，is before the two thousand nine. The ratio of the the mean weight, the over average decline, the over time, and from from two thousand nine. Last years. Also, if you look at the minimum weight as a percentage of the team, you can find the same turning point. So I think, yeah, uh, if you use the data uh, before the pool, sorry, uh, you will not see. But uh, after that, we will find more <coughs> effects, more significant effects. So the second phase is from 2009. This is such a Now we have a new government, which uh, really has a new mission, the change in the uh, economic groups in the last five years. Shift gradually from the more emphasis on economic growth, more social development, or from more concern with productive incentive, and to concern about the equitable distribution. Also, shift can be observed in the two, uh, top, the five year plan. That means uh, wedge growth and wedge inequality become new. Indicators for the central bank to evaluate and monitor the performance of local governments. Uh, so also, the local government has different motivations to determine the minimum wage and to implement the regulations. The sub yeah, local government have incentive to raise the minimum wage substantially. Try to police the central bank at some point that depends on the region. Uh, but generally, the unemployment argument and export argument. So, unemployment appears to minor, minor the problem in China. So, they become less important. So, that means some. Local government try to raise wage substantially, uh, try to use the mean wage to reduce wage inequality. So that's why we buy a lot of very large increase in the mean wage in the last two years. So, uh, the last issue is that what is new data? For employee the management efforts. It's uh, the survey conducted by the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security in 2009 and 2011. That in 2009 is a turning point from 2009 over five years. Big impact in way of the government. Uh, our yes, that is productive. Uh, so from the survey, it's because the survey conducted in the six provinces and the 35, 36 the cities. And from the employee, so what is the, uh, the data you can calculate is a survey. Uh, the growth of the wages in different cities. We just compare the growth of the wage to the average, the minimum wage, the growth in the three, three years. You will find most of the cities have the fast with the growth of the minimum wage, like the average. That is data from the uh, employee. 
Mali. So, uh, that way, contact the uh, uh, medicine, try to see the uh, full sledge, you know, the new sledge, uh, because the data has been information on the web is, for the web and the web components. Also, you have the personal characteristic information and a lot of information related to videos and also related to the animals. So, uh, now, yeah, we're so trying to... So when you say it applies to full-time jobs, do you mean yeah. it only applies to full-time workers? Yeah, the mostly wage, minimum wage. Yeah, we have a mostly wage, minimum wage, also power. Okay, but everyone's covered. I mean, yeah, everyone's covered. Full part-time uh, jobs. That difference in jobs. Uh, so, we just yeah, have some Prescriptive statistics to show, yeah, so you can buy uh, the percentage of the works below the minimum wage increase in yeah, the two years, uh, particularly for the females. So also, you can buy using uh, big increase <coughs> for the young cohorts and for the young cohorts. Also, you can buy for the, the group with different working periods, you can buy for the best periods that works and the people difference. Uh, so, also, for different education and timing, you can buy for the lower education. Also, for the difference, uh, the ownership, the firm with the ownership. Uh, is uh, for the firms, funding by Hong Kong, Taiwan, Hong Kong, they have a high proportion. They will have a proportion of the works with the value below the minimum. But they have a really big difference. Except for Hong Kong from Taiwan and Hong Kong. No, no, no. Between the new wedge and the new time of the 
Also for the difference in the female or people with low education, for young cohort, for less human, or the networks, low skill, are still work, for small class, the big difference. And so also we try to divide the regions. The circle. First is the growth of the mean wage, less than 30 percent, and uh, then between 30 and 40 percent, and over 40 percent, the world value. Uh, for <coughs> even for the less, even for the <coughs> growth, is the less than 30 percent.
Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, so I'll just write, go, go right to the topic. The topic is uh, minimum wage employment in China. And its co-author is Tony Fan from Monash University and University of Toronto. OK. So motivation, I think I can skip this one. It's a lot of expert in this room. And literature, you know, there are controversies, just as we discussed in the morning. And so Chinese scholars now have often argued in favor of the more proactive use of minimum wage in China, which they think the current level is too low and also very ineffective. And also opponents, uh, they don't like the minimum wage. The main reason because 
uh, this reduced China's comparative advantage and also uh, jeopardized the employment and welfare of low-wage workers. However, uh, the turn turning point, since 2004, the magnitude and man minimum wage changes has been substantial, both over time and across different jurisdictions. In January 2004, China promulgated the new minimum, mi new minimum wage law, is the new minimum wage regulation. And this regulation requires local governments should renew the standard at least once every two years. So this will increase the frequency a lot than before. And second, extended coverage to employees in self-employed business and to non full time workers. Uh, it's focused on uh, rural migrants because they were not covered previously. So this new law covers uh, rural migrants. And also, quintuple the penalties for violation or non-compliance. So the new regulation put into effect on March 1st, 2004, leading to frequent and substantial increase in minimum wage in uh, the subsequent years. And this graph, I just collect hand collected by our team. Uh, the over 2,080 counties in China from 1994 to 2012. So you can see that uh, the blue circle line is a nominal minimum wage national average. And also the green delta line is a real, adjusted for inflation. And the black dot line is the number of provinces that raised its minimum standard in each year. For example, 1998, about uh, nine provinces. 2004, about 27, 28 provinces. I just make a moving average to, to make more, uh, more readable. So you can th think, uh, look at this graph. 2004, just like a dividing point. Before, after, the frequency, uh, also the magnitude change a lot after 2004, the new minimum wage reg regulation. So our question is, how has this phenomenon affected the labor market in outcome in China? particularly uh, the employment. And there are several challenges. So the first one I would like to focus is there are at least three challenges uh, in measuring effect. In mainland China, uh, the administrative districts in China, the first level, there are two, 22 provinces, five autonomous regions, just like Inner Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang, and four municipality cities, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Chongqing, and Tianjin. So totally 30. And the second level, uh, about 332 prefecture cities, and also third level, over 2,800 counties. And provinces, for now on, I will call these first level provinces instead of uh, autonomous regions. So the first level provinces in China, they have considerable flexibility in setting their minimum wage standard. That results in several levels of minimum wage standard are applied to different counties within a province sometimes often three or four levels within the province, and different adjustment day among counties within the province. So this makes it more compli complicated than before. For example, uh, in Liaoning province, county A, county B can have different adjustment day. Suppose the county A uh, increased minimum wage on January the 1st. County B, maybe the neighbor, will change its minimum standard on July the 1st, so this makes uh, the data collection more complicated. And county or city level minimum wage data are now readily available, especially the micro level data. And it's very hard to find appropriate micro data in China that can possibly represent those people that are directly influenced by the minimum wage. And besides, uh, I want to emphasize this, is, I think it's crucial. Some provinces such as Beijing, Shanghai, they do not include social security payment and housing public or provident funds as part of the wage when calculating minimum wage. So this fact had made their official or the nominal minimum wage virtually higher. What do I mean? For example, suppose minimum wage of Chengde City in Hebei is the neighbor, neighbor's province uh, next to Beijing City. Suppose the Chengde City minimum wage was 500 RMB in 2005. Then firms are required to pay these two payments, uh, some payments, for a worker, for example, 200 RMB, then the firm can only pay for about 300, the remaining 500 minus 200. So the firm doesn't really have to pay 500, just pay about 300 RMB for his wage because 200 RMB is included in calculating the minimum wage in Hebei. But this case is not in Beijing or Shanghai. To be comparable across provinces, you have to account for this issue. Is that decided by the province? Yes.
So now uh, I can say four, Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Henan, and Jiangxi. These four or five provinces, they do, when they calculate minimum wage, uh, you cannot include those things, those payments in there. So it's very, without accounting for this issue, according to our calculation, the difference is really substantial. So our strategy, we use a large county panel of all counties in China between 2002 and 2009, and county data provide a very good representation and more variation in detecting the effect and allow us to directly evaluate the effect of the subgroups, such as young adults, low skilled worker, or females. And we use the, the research type by David and followed by uh, these two authors of, in, in the papers. And we used 2004, uh, the year that the new minimum wage regulation was issued as a quasi experiment. And these three authors uh, in their paper, they have discussed detail about uh, why 2004 reform is a very good, nice cost experiment to try to uh, more or less alleviate or mitigate uh, the indigeneity problem. Okay. So preview a result. Our results support the traditional view, uh, uh, competitive model, that an increase in minimum wage reduce employment for low wage worker. And I just quickly uh, summarize this, our result. For the whole country, this number, this is the current year minimum wage. This is a lack, lack effect. And we found that these are all statistically significant, and they are, these, these are uh, uh, interpreted as elasticities. And we find that the minimum wage has the largest adverse effect on the employment of at risk group. We define at risk people as those workers whose monthly wage are between the old and the new minimum wage. So they are at risk. Okay? And these are elasticities and relative bigger than and the, low wage, uh, the low wage workers. And also, we analyze by regions, by the more prosperous east part of China, and these are statistically significant, and also central, and also uh, the western regions, okay? And we do not find any uh, significant effect in the western region. We also look at the migrants, although this urban household survey, but we do have very few, not very few, few households that are defined as migrants, but we have to check for this issue using another data set. Anyway, and our estimate uh, seems to offer a reconciliation of the conflict result of the previous study. For example, this three also Ni Wan Yao in 2011, they focused on all employees over 2000, 2005, and they find negative effect in the east part, positive effect in the central and the west. And the same year, Wang and Gonderson, they used 2000 to 2007 data on rural migrants, and they find positive effect in the state-owned enterprises in the West, in the East, excuse me. Negative effects in the Central and the West. So that's why in the morning we have seen uh, several previous study in China, they have mixed results, just like this. And interesting part of this one is that their results by regions are the opposite of each other, okay? And in our study, we use, if you use all employees, we find similar result to the first paper, however, uh, the positive effect is not stat statistically significant. I'm sorry, didn't you say, didn't your earlier slide say that the total effect was negative? Yes. The one before that. Right. So, so that second bullet, is that aggregate employment? Yeah, this is. Oh, that's young adults, sorry. Yeah, young adults. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I have the entire population, the yeah. estimate for the entire population. So if we focus on rural migrants, we find similar result to the second paper although the positive effect is not significant, okay, but seems to uh, uh, reconcile those conflict results. We also separate by time periods uh, pre before 2004, after 2004. We do not find any significant effect in the pre-2004 period, but adverse employment effect after 2004. Also look at by scale level. Less skilled workers, they are relatively vulnerable when facing minimum wage increases. We find a mild, relative mild adverse effect on the employment or less skilled worker, we define less skilled worker or high school graduate or below. And these are uh, uh, elasticities and they are statistically significant. And we, we do not find any effect on college graduate, so it seems like it's a good uh, falsification test or placebo test. Uh, I'm, uh, not this is of all workers, at least, not young workers. All workers, all workers by skill levels. Okay, so not if, no effect on college graduate or above. 
Uh, the history, I think Professor Lee had discussed in the morning, so uh, before 1994, China has no, had no minimum wage law. And the first one was in 1994, starting uh, from Guangdong province. And they, they set up their minimum wage standard according to the five principles. And in 2004, uh, now, uh, main feature coverage is standard and frequencies increase a lot and established two types of minimum wage. Monthly wage applied to full-time worker, hourly wage applied to non-full-time worker. And how does the minimum wage in China be determined? And the setting and adjustment of the minimum wage standard of each province or the most regions, municipality should be drawn up together by three parties in, written in the law. First one, the local government, the provincial government, and the trade union, and also enterprise confederations. And the draft is required to submit it to the Ministry of Labor and Social Security in Beijing for review. And the ministry then asks for opinion for two, two parties. The first one, all China Federation of Trade Unions. Second, the China Enterprise Confederation. Just ask for opinion. Then the ministry can request a revision within 14 days after receiving the proposed draft. If no revision is brought up after 14 days, then the proposed new minimum wage program is regarded as passed. Uh, in the past, uh, there's no uh, revision before. As long as the government proposes the draft, then it is, it is passed all the time. So the new regulation requires local government renew the, the standard at least once every two years. Penalty violation were quintupled and so forth. Now it's our data and summary stats. We use two sources data. Uh, the first one, the annual urban household survey from 2002 to 2009 is conducted by MBS of China. And minimum wage data collected at a county level between 1994 to 2012. Then we merged the two, two, two data sets and obtained a 16 province county level data set over this period. And this 16 province sample cover about over 60% of the counties over the country. And we restrict our sample to working age populations between 15 to 64 years old, employed and report past earnings and not self employed and not enrolled in school. And we keep only salary workers who work for 12 months, then divided by the annual wage by 12 to obtain monthly wage for each year. And simple ways are using our calculation and we constructed an uh, aggregate county level panel. So in this paper, this is aggregate county level, it's not individual. So this is our sample. The darker area represents the sample covered in our, in our data set. And so those less economically important provinces, Xinjiang, Tibet, Qinghai, or Inner Mongolia, they are not in our sample. But however, still our 16 province sample cover almost most important uh, economical pro important provinces. And this is stats for two important key variables. The first one, minimum wage over average race ratio. I mean, so overall in our total sample is about 0 0.291, about. And employment to popula population ratio is about 0 0.595. And for male, you can see that for male and female, the minimum over average ratio for male is relatively lower than female, so it's reasonable. About employment to population ratio, male is higher than female, so it's also reasonable. We also look at different regions, east part, central, and the west. In the more prosperous east part of China, so the minimum to average ratio, average wage ratio is considerably lower, it's also correct. West part is less developed, so this, the ratio will be higher, and also is correct for employment to population ratio. We also look at age cohort, and also educational attainment, so uh, I don't have much time to discuss this, but overall, the stats is quite, quite intuitive and reasonable. And also we look at by different industries, uh, the highest minimum wage to average ratio should be, I think, is housekeeping and also hotel, restaurant, and wholesale retail sales. For housekeeping, the minimum over average wage, average wage is over 50%. Okay, so. And lowest one should be, I think, is scientific research or banking and finance. And we also look at different, three different categories. Lost worker who are earning less than the minimum, just the minimum, and also more than the minimum. 
for the entire population our, in our sample, about 5.62% workers, they are earning less than minimum, about 3.28%, just the minimum. And over 91%, uh, they are earning over the minimum wage. And also uh, by region, by age cohort, and also educational attainment. Okay. And also we look at different industries. And here comes the empirical method. So the estimation equation is this one. This is the employment to population ratio of county I in year T is our dependent variable. And we had two key explanatory variable. The current year, I mean, minimum wage IT represent the minimum to average wage ratio of county I in year T. And this is the lack effect. Okay, so we have current year effect and also lack effect. And X is a set of control variable in Q, which includes county consumption expansion per capita, GB per capita, and also county level uh, foreign direct investment. And also we had fixed year effect and fixed county effect, and this is the uh, epsilon is the error term. And we also uh, run a regression using uh, a size of labor force in each county. And also we use cluster robust uh, standard errors. So empirical result one, we find adverse employment uh, effect or minimum wage over all China in the east and in the central. We did not find any effect in the less developed, developed west part. So uh, I hope this is clear. So three groups, first one, young adults, which define as age 15 to 29. At risk, those workers whose wages are between the old and new minimum wage, entire sample. So you can see for the current year effect and the lack effect, they are, uh, most of them, they are statistically significant and negative. Uh, and we look at the east part and pretty much uh, didn't change uh, the result. And also the central and the west, we do not find any effect, significant effect in the west. So for the first, first model, the first, first scenario, uh, we, find, we do find adverse uh, effect, important effect on young adults and also those at risk group, but not in the west part of China. We also look at genders and age cohort. We find adverse employment effect on minimum wage on young female workers. And we find a positive effect for age 30 to 39 male workers in the West. So uh, we interpret this as maybe some substitution uh, among, among the West. Okay. So this is uh, about four categories, different age cohort, 15 to 29, 30 to 30, 39, 40 to 49, and also 50 to 64 by all regions, East, Central, and West. And we also look at different skill level, and we find adverse employment effect on minimum wage on low skill worker over China in the East and the Central, and no effect in the West uh, by skill levels. So we divided by high school or below, vocational school, junior college, and college or above. You can see for high school or below, the current year effect negative and also statistically significant. And we do not find any effect for college graduate or above, okay? And it's in the east, in the central, and in the west. And we do not find any effect in the west part. Number four, although I, we, we, I say in the beginning, there's very few migrants household in the survey, but we are able to, to do that in, in, this, in this data set. So we find adverse employment effect or minimum wage in the west, and positive estimate in the east, uh, they are not statistically significant. Okay. So to address some aforementioned indigeneity issues, so we try to use uh, year 2004 as a quasi-experiment, try to at least more or less uh, mitigate the internationally uh, indigenous problem. So we find adverse employment effect in the post-2004 period, no effect before the 2004 by all regions, east, par, and central, and west. So finally, we discussed our result. So we find that in the more developed East China, negative employment effect of the current and lack minimum wage on young adults, and elasticities are between negative 0.088 to negative 0.136 or negative 0.155. Although the number are small, they are in the range of those found in the study of developed and developing countries and are very likely inside the consensus range. 
according to, to uh, Davis, uh, Davis' book. And second point, minimum wage changes result in a large lagged disemployment effect for at risk group. And these numbers are relatively large than those young adults. And these large effects are more, lag effect are more prominent than the current minimum wage effect. So it means that uh, it takes sufficient time for the effect of minimum wage on employment to happen. So that's why the lag effect are larger than the current effect. And, and these are, uh, these lag effect, larger lag effect are found in this Canada, US, uh, or Chinese provincial level studies. Second one, we want to explain uh, our result on rural urban migrants. We find positive estimate, but they are not statistic statistically significant in the East. It's because labor shortage of migrant worker in the coastal East part of China in recent years, starting in 2004, according to, to Chai Fang, uh, their study. And these effects are statistically insignificant. It's consistent with the minimum wage having no employment effect in such prosperous and rapidly growing region, where the minimum wage is simply a non-binding constraint, according to Wang and Gangdon's paper. And maybe because more job creation in the East part and the turn turnovers for migrant worker in the East. And negative employment effect in the West and estimates of non-state-owned enterprises are larger than, than the East part. Our explanation is that labor surplus of migrant worker in the Central and the West uh, and migrants are likely to, they likely to work in non-state-owned enterprises. And these non-state-owned enterprises, they are more responsive to market pressure. That's why when minimum wage increases, they are more responsive to, to, the, to this institutional change. For young adults and at risk group, we find negative employment effect in the East part. This is consistent with the traditional view. And Ni Wang and Yao, they find similar results and second point, lack negative employment effect in Central and no effect in the West. And more young adults and every group work in state-owned enterprises in the East part than the Central part. So state-owned enterprises, they are less responsive to market pressure. That's why you find uh, this, this effect in the Central and the West. And overall, young adults, every group, and migrants, uh, they are not the same group. We check these three groups uh, one by one. About less than 3% young adults, they are at risk group. About less than 3% uh, at risk group, they are young adults. So they, these three different groups, they face different uh, uh, labor market. So that's why the employment effect tends to differ among these three groups. Finally, our conclusion. Uh, compared to previous study that used aggregate, aggregated macro data at a provincial level, this paper we use county level minimum wage combined with a micro data, a household survey with some longitudinal features. To estimate the important effect of minimum wage changes in China over 2004 to 2009 period, and our results support the traditional view, the competitive model, that an increase in the minimum wage reduces employment of low wage worker, and minimum wage changes have significant negative effect on employment in the east and central part of China and result in disappointment for females, young workers, young adults, and less skilled workers. Particularly for those at risk group, they have, they face the largest negative impact from the minimum wage increase. So thank you very much. And with time to spare, so that's great, thanks. Uh, so the discussion is Jia Pang from uh, Taifang's group uh, at uh, the Chinese <laughs> Chinese Center. My name is uh, Jia Feng. I'm a professor from Institute of Population and Labor Economics uh, at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I want to thank Professor Park for the invitation. I'm also glad to meet Professor Newman and uh, Professor I. Some of my own work on minimum wages are deeply inspired by yours. Uh, I have met Dr. Lin on several occasions, and uh, I'm really impressed by his work on minimum wages. And, Although the minimum wage regulation has a history of almost 20 years, and uh, however, for a long time, both the Chinese government and uh, the economist seems to have no interest in a serious evaluation of the uh, uh, regulation. This paper represents Dr. Yin's efforts in uh, estimating 
the chiral effects of minimum wage on employment in China using a unique county-level minimum wage database and uh, uh, survey data from Urban Household Survey. Uh, Dr. Lin finds that uh, the minimum wage changes have negative impacts on employment, especially for young people, uh, female, and uh, uh, some at-risk uh, groups. Well, I do agree with Dr. Lin that uh, this uh, is a serious study on minimum wage effects in China. I also have some concern over the data and uh, uh, specification. First, the minimum wage regulation was uh, established to protect the interest of disadvantaged workers uh, in China, especially the migrant workers. As a result, the uh, evaluation of minimum wage regulation should also focus on uh, migrant workers. Also, these people have a, a special section of migrant workers, but I, I, I think it's uh, uh, not enough. In this paper, Dr. Lin used the micro data from uh, Urban Household Survey, uh, which is considered to be one of the best sources for uh, labor economics research. But uh, before 2012, there are separate uh, urban and uh, rural uh, household surveys. And uh, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, 80% of migrant workers are not represented in the urban uh, household survey, so which makes the UHS a poor uh, representation of the uh, urban labor market. So if, if you have access to the rural household survey, maybe uh, you can uh, combine the two sources of information and see what happens to the migrant workers. Second, the dependent variable uh, in this uh, paper is employment to uh, population ratio, and uh, the key explanatory variable is the minimum, minimum wage index, which is the minimum, minimum wage to average uh, wage ratio. Uh, we can find from some microeconomic indicators that uh, between 2004 and uh, 2009, the employment to uh, population ratio has been increasing, although the uh, speed is very slow. At the same time, the minimum wage to average wage uh, uh, ratio has been uh, declining. So it is very nat natural to find a uh, negative relationship between these two variables. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, we can continue the increase of minimum wages, as long as the increase of minimum wage does not exceed the uh, increase or average wage. So uh, I wonder why don't you use the nominal minimum wage or the real minimum wages as an explanatory variable? And uh, maybe you can find a uh, positive effects of minimum wage on employment. Uh, third, uh, Dr. Lin finds that minimum wage changes have negative impact on employment of some at-risk groups, which is defined as the people between the old and uh, new minimum wage. Uh, since the dependent variable is um, employment to population ratio, uh, in the regression for at-risk groups, uh, I assume that uh, the dependent variable would be the proportion of employed persons between the old and the new minimum wages uh, uh, in the total population. However, this changes uh, in this proportion does not uh, uh, reflect uh, any uh, uh, positive or negative effects of the uh, minimum wage effects because it may be simply the case that the new minimum wage is uh, much higher than the old minimum wage and uh, a lot more people will fall between the, uh, these two standards. So there may be a false uh, uh, correlation between these two variables. Finally, the enforcement of minimum wage in China is a serious problem. and. Uh, uh, as, 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 as evident from our discussion in the morning. So I think maybe in the regression, uh, maybe you can add some uh, variables representing the enforcement on the minimum wage or some interaction term between these variables. So uh, this will conclude my comment, and uh, maybe I expect a quick reply to, uh, from Dr. Lee. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm so happy to, f to have all the experts here. So I'm a quite new guy to this area, so please just uh, give me any comments you have. Uh, I know Albert and my discussants have already a lot of bullets, so please just pause me and fire. Uh, my name is Goi Wang. I'm from uh, the Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong, so my, the 
my co-authors are Yi Huang from Graduate Institute in Switzerland and the Percussion in INF. So a little bit about the motivation still. So here's the, some, uh, some art, uh, one article I take from uh, a newspaper. So it says just like when the Shenzhen with the highest minimum wage in China, so it raises uh, the minimum wage in 2012 by like 16%. And this, uh, the following statement uh, was raised by a uh, deputy chairman uh, who, who was from kind of uh, uh, Association of Hong Kong Industries speaking on behalf of Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong businessmen who worked at Shenzhen. So it seems like so the, the rise in the minimum wage could uh, deteriorate from performance. And then because if a firm cannot do good, so it will harm its uh, employment. And we know, so like China so started to build a harmonious society. Uh, so th this is kind of uh, some jargon uh, used by our former president. And uh, also pr priority is jobs. This has been used a lot, especially you can hear that from our prime minister. So this kind of seems like a like a trade off. Like, uh, so social equity and employment. So th that, that's definitely a, a big thing. So I'm, I will not like uh, cover this minimum wage policy a lot because like a lot of uh, experts, Professor Lee and uh, Carl has already discussed that. So let me just focus on the kind of 2004, this kind of enforcement uh, tightening, right? So, so it has a couple of uh, things going on at that time. So it extends its coverage from uh, essentially, uh, previously, uh, state firms and other uh, other firms in urban areas. So now it extends to town, village enterprises and self-employed uh, business. And also, it includes hourly minimum wages. The third, that's very important. So it raises the penalty because there is no such thing to quantify the, how government should set it, the, the intensity of enforcement. So here, the rule only requires. Uh, about the penalty, so here it raises by uh, five times uh, at that time. Also, the, the adjustment needs to be uh, more frequent, so at least once every two years. So we're gonna, in this paper, we're gonna focus on this a uh, lot, so try to see uh, whether before this time and after this time, so the effect of the minimum wage changed a lot or not. Uh, the empirical literature, so I think most of you uh, have known this. So basically from developed countries, the evidence is still mixed. Uh, from China, so uh, I think uh, basically, so I just have very brief review and, and we have some basic evidence from aggregate employment at the regional level. So it has uh, the minimum wage policy has kind of a negative effect, but not generally negative. For example, uh, in, in Carl's uh, paper, so they, I think uh, they haven't found the effect on male employment. So mainly it's just, just uh, the effect lies on females if, if uh, the result still remains there. All right. So about this paper, so, so it, this paper is tried trying to estimate the effect of the minimum wage on firm employment. And here, the first thing, so that's same, so we kind of use same uh, source of the data of minimum wages, it's at county level. And also we uh, just take advantage of this county level uh, minimum wages. So we try to explore geographic proximity because like for counties, you know, in China, counties is, is kind of, uh, has a size uh, ranging from 20 uh, to 2,000 square kilometers. So basically, it's the size of Hong Kong sort of thing. So uh, because of this uh, small size, so you can think of two ca neighbor counties can have a lot of similar characteristics. Uh, the third thing is, okay, so we're gonna look at the uh, firm level employment, so this can give us uh, extra benefit, uh, so we can discuss later. So, and the second, the fourth thing is, okay, so we're gonna try to uh, examine the heterogeneous effect. So like different firm may respond to the minimum wage hike differently. Okay, so the, the second thing is just about the 2004 reform in the minimum wages. 
So here are some basic results we have. Uh, first, so for the post-enforcement tightening period from 2005 to 2007, the, the, the average elasticity here we estimated is negative 0.1. So it's, it's sort of big, like uh, in the common range uh, just introduced just uh, by Davis, so it's right. So it's like 10% rise in the uh, minimum wage will lead to a 1% decline in uh, employment. So that, that that's For a bit. Some low skill group. Oh, so here we just uh, uh, so this result is for all the firms. So taken. That's not uh, that's not a so th that, that's large actually because this I will I will just uh, let you know our sample a little bit later, and uh, here so. Let's look at the pre-tightening period from 2000 to 2004. This time, um, the average elasticity of the minimum wage is a little bit positive, but not significant at all. So, so there's a huge difference between the pre-tightening period and the post-tightening period. But the results, so we have tried a little bit more, and we, we have found that so this kind of uh, uh, negative results just uh, happened like from 2005, not exactly in 2004, but uh, you know, so this kind of reform was enacted in March, so it's hard to know whether uh, it should start from 2004, 2005. And then the, here for heterogeneous response, we have found that basically we focus on wage groups, uh, and we found that the firms with higher wage respond to the minimum wage hike less negatively. It's like more uh, positively, but still negative, but much smaller in magnitude than this number. Uh, and uh, this also is, is true before and after enforcement tightening. So for example, for this number, so of course the firms with higher wage will have a higher elasticity than this number. Uh, we also try to use continuous uh, uh, interaction terms and try to see if different firms respond to the minimum wage policy differently. And the here, we use the continuous uh, variable of firm wage. So here, it shows a quite large difference uh, before and after this tightening. And the, but the profit margin just means a firm with higher profit margin respond to uh, the minimum wage hike more positively, and the SVC is very large. And here, so, uh, because uh, Professor Lee has already discussed this, I'm going to just uh, quickly go over this. So here, it's, it's, it's a little bit weird because it, for, at the country level, so you, you can see such a kind of U curve, a U curve. But here, at the city level, actually, I haven't found, so for like, like the city, so here we divide, we rank the, t so the total city number is 335, and we, uh, we pick some top minimum wage cities and the mi median minim uh, minimum wage cities and the bottom minimum wage cities. Or, <clears throat> so those cities are ranked by their minimum wages in 2010. Here you can see, uh, basically we haven't found any U shape for a lot of cities, but just for some a little bit cities just happening. This kind of uh, trial just uh, happened around the 2008 something, right? So it's just the, the Great Recession period. And the, the basic message is that, so we have a kind of large variation across regions, also across time, right? So because sometimes some candidates simply did not adjust. So we're gonna see up and down for those, uh, for those ratios of minimum wage to city average wage. Yichun, right? Yichun, uh, I think should be, uh, those, those are cities, prefecture cities. No, but what province oh, is it in? Uh, Sichuan, right? And uh, here, Jiangxi, Jiangxi, and uh, they are quite close, basically. They, they, I think it's Yichun, Jiangxi. <laughs> what? Yichun? So are you talking about Yichun? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not from Sichuan province. There's another one, you mean? <laughs> What's the Chinese name of this? Yichun? Yichun. Yichun. Right? <laughs> a city which is named the spring. Okay, so, so they, they are kind of neighbor cities. They are kind of neighbor cities, those, those three. 
Those three are kind of new. You know those are Shanghai, Hangzhou, and Shenzhen. Okay. So and our data also gives us advantage to look at the relative minimum wage, which is defined by the ratio of city minimum wage to a firm average wage. So here is the city average from employee wage. You can see it's, it's actually kind of flatter than the previous slide, which shows. So, so it just means actually firm average tracks the minimum wage better than the city average wage. This is a very interesting uh, thing. And uh, another uh, phenomenon is that so this kind of enforcement tightening did not change the level of minimum wage adjustment. So it, you can think, OK, so it can it improves uh, the intensity, increases the intensity of enforcement. But it will not uh, just uh, leads the government to adjust aggressively in the minimum wage level. OK, so this is a basic empirical uh, uh, statistics. So here, we are going to follow this roadmap, data framework, findings, and then a little bit robustness check. And here, the data, just kind of same source. Uh, so it's at county level. And we use, because our firm data is uh, annual level, so we, we just sum up all the monthly minimum wages together, so we, we have kind of annual minimum wage. So we, we're going to use that. Sometimes we use, we use uh, monthly average uh, minimum wage, but if we take logs, that's basically the same. And then we have some macroeconomic data. They are all from city levels, because it's hard, very hard for me to find out, for us to find a panel data of uh, macroeconomic variables at the, this county level. Here, the firm data has been used ex extensively uh, in the research on TFP in China, also export FDI, those kind of things. But this kind of uh, this study is the first study which uh, combined this data with the minimum wage policy. So this data, how representative is it? And the, this data only covers industry firms. So from the 2004 census, we can compare this uh, survey to the census. And you can see it covers more than 90% of total output. And also for employment, it also covers more than uh, 71%. But there is some problem of, of this data. Uh, so one thing is about the sampling bias. It oversamples large firms. Oversamples large firms. So we, are, we try to balance the data a little bit. Try to also, sometimes we try to restrict our sample to small firms. But still, this can be seen as a limitation of the, this research. If, if uh, you want to argue, so it can, small firms uh, are exposed more to the minimum wage changes. There really are no small firms in this data. Right? I mean, really oh, they, they are. They are. So I, I have done a lot of uh, statistics for that. Very few for uh, for non state firms, just like 2% of uh, them are just a, a small firm. I say small firms which, which have few, uh, less than 5 million uh, China's yuan sales every year. So we, we call those small firms. Let's define them small, as small firms. So very few still are sampled in the survey, but very few. Uh, but for state firms, before 2005, actually, uh, their percentage are kind of 5%, 6% every year. But compared to the 2004 census, you can see. So it's definitely significantly undersampled for small firms. I have some statistics in my paper about this. All right, so, so here I need a text, textbook model to pin down the, the variables I want to throw in the regression. Uh, here, so first, so let's just look at the demand side first. And uh, we, we can see, so here, following some basic uh, setting and uh, labor demand that can be pinned down just by the aggregated demand from characteristics and the, the market prices, especially uh, so here, if we assume there are three inputs, then we have the wage rate, the capital price, and the intermediate goods price. 
So, uh, so here, if we wanted to account for labor demand, we just need to find the proxies for those variables. And how about labor supply? This is a little bit hard because for firm specific labor supply, it's hard to find a, a sort of a proxy for that. So here, I want to consider uh, some thing, uh, some model which is can be developed by using monopsony or efficiency wage or search model. It's just like when when those frictions exist then labor demand might not be equal to labor supply. So sometimes firm employment can be supply constrained, which means it's, it's binding by labor supply, but there might be some excess labor demand. So uh, in the sense that the firm still optimizes its em employment. So this is a, still a textbook example, but so here the crucial uh, parameter here is the elasticity of uh, individual labor supply. Uh, but when the, the employment is constrained to supply, then the elasticity of labor supply is actually equal to the elasticity of wage or employment, which is we want to estimate. So uh, here, I want to find a proxy of labor supply elasticity. Uh, I'm not saying so this is equal to from wage, I just want to argue here, if we, uh, if we control for demand side factors, then uh, firm wage might measure a firm's, for example, monopsony power or something. So, uh, so if a firm faces a higher elasticity of labor supply, it will offer uh, comparatively higher firm wages. So, so from this point of view, firm wage can be sort of like a thing like a, a kind of imperfect proxy, proxy of labor supply elasticity. Okay, all right. So the main uh, identification strategy is first, you know, so um, the minimum wage policy is definitely not exogenous uh, from the perspective of policy making. So the first strategy we have is try to control for minimum wage determinants as many as possible. And we are going to show uh, a table for minimum wage accounting. And here, because so this is a benefit to use firm data. So if we assume firms do not observe more than us uh, economists, so this just means, OK, so maybe this assumption is definitely strong, but you can see this as a benchmark uh, assumption. So this means. So for minimum wage shocks that we cannot observe, uh, we cannot observe the source, then firms also do not observe that. So this will not change a firm's decision. So this can be as a, like a benchmark as, uh, assumption. And also we use uh, a panel data. Also we use a dynamic, dynamic model because we uh, Argue so firm employment is definitely uh, adjusted very slowly. So lagged, lagged employment account for a lot of firm specific characteristics. It's important to control for that. And also we use we use this neighbor region approach. Actually, uh, was developed a long time ago. So here Carter Kruger. You can see that as just one special case of that because it uses just one pair of neighbor uh, states, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So that, that's sort of uh, just the uh, same thing. And the do but just use the whole country and it finds uh, so, uh, those counties across the province border and try to use neighbor counties to control for time varying unobservable factors. And also we use kind of subsamples before and after enforcement tightening to see how the minimum wage effect changes over time. And the heterogeneous effect, we uh, either use separate groups or we just use interaction terms to estimate the result. This is the kind of the main framework we have, the, the estimation equation. The only thing uh, 
mu, I think, is this term. So I'm going to explain this one by one. So here is, this is a firm level regression, and we have a la one lag, one period lag dependent variable on the right hand side, and the C is candy, so this is kind of minimum wage variable. We have uh, here P denotes a candy pair, uh, a neighbor candy pair. I will tell you how we constructed this sample. So, and the T denotes years. So, those variables are very common. So we control for a lot of firm characteristics and the macroeconomic variables based on. Uh, the kind of our basic theoretical framework. And, and we also focus on this key variable, annual minimum wages. And we control for firm fixed effect, year fixed effect, plus this candy pair dummy by year uh, fixed effect. This just means we use neighbor counties as kind of control groups. So how do you decide what a neighbor uh, I will tell you later. So, uh, if if two counties share same continuous border, and their centroids are within eighty kilometers, we de define them as neighbor counties. Because in China, some counties are so large, we just exclude them. Mm. Yeah, I will discuss this a little bit more later. And uh, here we also introduce some. Uh, kind of genus effects by uh, enriching this kind of coefficient. <laughs> but, uh, so this is kind of a linear, uh, linear model for the coefficient, which means it, it depends on from characteristics. So we can measure the heterogeneous response from this equation. So, so neighbor candy pairs. Neighbor candy, the intuition is very similar. So, uh, Card and Kruger is just like they use kind of one pair, and uh, here we, we have a lot of pairs. We're going to stack them together to estimate the average treatment effect. And so here I choose the threshold to, to be 5%. So it, it's just because if I throw in all the neighbor candy pairs, so a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of neighbor counties uh, have their minimum wages co-move all the time. So it's kind of sort of this variable then uh, could be collinear with this candy pair by year fixed effect. So here I need some variation between their minimum wages. So th that's why I use kind of 5%. But I have other robustness checks with other threshold. And uh, so here I, we identified then kind of 2,000 pairs uh, in China, and the one, one crucial thing is uh, their locations, right? So if they are in different provinces, you might want to think, okay, they're kind of uh, not similar, right? So in two provinces. So here, actually, we have all the candy pairs, more than 80% lo located in the same province. So th th that's good news, actually, for us. And we have kind of uh, results separately for those candy pairs. Here, the main results focus on all the pairs. And also, uh, you can see the size, also distributed mainly around 10%. But there are some extreme uh, difference in minimum wage changes. More than 30% candy pairs have kind of a minimum wage change difference more than 15%. And here is a kind of a visualization of uh, those candy pairs. But for the reduction of uh, clustering, here uh, only shows uh, those pairs with more than 30% difference in their minimum wage hikes, in their minimum wage growth. So uh, then you can see a lot of pairs are just straddling a province border because this kind of large difference in minimum wage growth can only happen uh, between two provinces most of the time, right? But still, we can see some pairs within a province, especially in Liaoning, Guangdong, uh, Hunan, right? But you can see a lot of uh, pairs just uh, across the border. This is uh, more common for large difference, for large difference in hikes. All right. Here, uh, our control variables just follow the. Uh, 
follow the theory, and we control for city level variables. So this, uh, we think it can account for some aggregate demand, and this account for living cost. And also industrial wage, those are kind of proxies for firm wages, and those are price variables. Those are uh, measures aggregate demand, industry output. And here, those are two parameters are very crucial uh, for firm individual demand. For firm level variables, we think they account for a firm's individual uh, labor supply. Also, it account for uh, individual demand. A lot of things, so especially ownership, profit margins, and the export to sales ratios. So here we use one year lag, uh, their employment, and this sales just account for a firm size. And then here are our main findings. So first, let's just account for minimum wage determinants. And then let's see how minimum wage is determined. So in fact, in fact, in the law, there's a formula for that, right? So it depends on a couple of things, like five or six factors. And we just throw in a lot of macroeconomic variables to see which explain more uh, the change in city minimum wages. Here you can see, so if we just use one variable, actually city average has an elasticity larger than one. So it's, it's quite uh, highly correlated with city average. And here, so just like uh, cars, uh, what cars did, so we also use a fixed asset investment because we believe this variable may be a proxy of a future growth potential which might be uh, concerned by uh, local government officials, right? So because they don't want uh, the minimum wage too high to damage a region's growth potential, right? So, so if the investment's high, so they're, they're not worried worry about the future growth, so, so it's safe to raise the minimum wage. Okay. And the, the growth of GDP, so it's hard to explain this. This might not just indicate, okay, so if past growth is high, so maybe a region still wants to maintain a high growth rate, so they don't want to raise the minimum wage. But this is just one explanation for that. Here we have some local labor uh, supply variables. Is they, are not, they are not significant in this case. Mm. How about before enforcement tightening period? So here you can see so it's negative and not significant. So this just <coughs> implies that it's so not frequent to adjust minimum wages before 2004. So it's kind of uh, uh, was frozen over time. So for a lot of counties, they only adjusted minimum wages uh, by two or three times before 2004. So, so it's very hard to account for uh, min minimum wages before the tightening period, you can see. And so our strategy is just, okay, so th these variables are important. They, they, if we don't control them, they, there could be more endogeneity issues, so, so let's just control all of them, so here in the model. And here is the basic result for minimum wage elasticities. Let's first just use the whole sample and use interaction terms to see how the minimum wage effects change over time for every year in the sample. So, and you can see here, actually, uh, the, the effect starts to be significant from zero from 2003, actually. But the change from 2002 here, from uh, negative 0 0.025 to negative 0 0.048 is not significant. However, 2004 doesn't give us a kind of a negative change in the elasticity. Only starting from 2005, you can see the effect becomes very large. And 2006, there was a little bit of reversal, but in 2007, so the result is quite similar here, right? So you just, it's hard to explain this change, right, from 2002 to 2003, so, so uh, we are not quite sure about that. But it, it's, it's wise to just do more experimentations to see how, how it changes over time. So here first, first I'm going to speed up a little bit. And here you can see we have this uh, division, so the, the, the change is so large. 
But if we divide this period just using the year of 2004, it's a little bit, they, they both uh, shrink a little bit. So, so here we just stick to this, this kind of pre and post tightening uh, division here. And here we use, uh, let's see. Okay, so here, uh, let's look at the effect of other variables, right? And you can see here, uh, for other variables, the explanatory power doesn't seem to uh, surpass this minimum wage variable here, right? Um, for those original variables. However, for firm own characteristics, they are quite uh, highly correlated with uh, its uh, employment level, and the signs are mostly uh, consistent with. Okay, consistent with the model. And here, uh, I show the difference between whether to control neighbor candy pair dummies or not. So if we control that, we have kind of much more negative results, right? So if we don't control neighbor candy pairs, okay, it's still negative and sort of uh, significant at the 5% level, but it's much negative. If you can think of some missing variables which are both positively related to the minimum wage and positively related to from employment, then it will bias the result upward. So this might just suggest, okay, so the, the control of neighbor county pairs uh, can account for such factors uh, to some extent. Oh, sorry. So here, let's just uh, analyze the channel a little bit. If a firm's employment declines, so there got to be some channel. It should be the firm wage. If the firm wage does not change according to the minimum wage, how can uh, the minimum wage affect a firm's employment? So you can see, so uh, the result is quite large. So uh, of course, other wage variables still show a uh, very large coefficient, but, but you know, firm wage tracks the minimum wage uh, quite closely here. And so we use like a lagged firm wage as a kind of uh, heterogeneous groups to see their responses to the minimum wage actually. So here it shows a monotone pattern here and for the wage group with the bottom wage it shows a much more negative uh, elasticity to the minimum wage but for the top group it's just uh, not significant anymore. How about before period? It's very interesting to see some some significantly positive effect and and if you look at this graph, right, so here, so the pattern still remains, but the overall effect just declines here. And uh, we use interaction terms because we want to control for other demand factors to see if this can account for more about the heterogeneity. But before period now, it becomes insignificantly positive. And we have also other robustness checks by using different thresholds to identify neighbor candy pairs. We also want to see if the minimum wage affects firm exit, but uh, we haven't found uh, much evidence for that. We also uh, shift the treatment back for one year. So, so assuming there is no expectation effect, actually there is no, so the acid is positive now and not significant. So, okay, so our finding is just like uh, the minimum wage policy leads firms to reduce their employment, but we still don't have evidence about those displaced workers. So, and, and I think uh, like uh, Professor Lee and uh, Carl, the, the, their research can, uh, can contribute to this. So, so, I mean, the, the minimum wage policy raised the wage rate for poorly paid workers and reduced the firm employment, but still, if the government can create other opportunities for them, like a service sector or something, so th this might not be bad for them. And also, the government plays an important role here if the enforcement tightening result is true, so the kind of uh, law regulation just amplified the, the result, so it works. Okay, so we have some research in progress. Yeah, first, like heterogeneity across regions. Also, we try to uncover the compliance from the US, UHS data and to combine, to combine that uh, with this research. All right, so this is a, a whole for this presentation. Thank you.
so this is uh, Xinjiang, so I'm in Qinghai and visiting the CUHK. So let me uh, let me uh, briefly summarize the paper. The research question of this paper is uh, what's the impact of minimum wage on the employment in China? And the authors use three uh, sources of data. One is the uh, manufacturing firms. The other one is the county level minimum wage data, and then the macro data is in the city level. And then the, the main progress strategy they use is a pair county approach. And they have two main findings. The first one is the minimum wage has a significant negative effects on the employment, especially after 2004 when the enforcement of the minimum wage was strengthened. And then the heterogeneous effect exists. And I actually have some uh, comments and questions. The first one, the first comment is on the theory, because the, the authors mainly derive the labor demand function, which is the base of the empirical specification. However, as we know, any observed em employment, is, even if it is in a firm level, is, is an equilibrium outcome, meaning that it, it is determined by the demand and supply. So in the empirical study, it's better to include variables representing labor supply, because in this variables might be correlated with minimum wage and also affects the, the firm level employment causing an endogenous problem. And the second thing is that I'm kind of, I'm kind of confused by this uh, labor demand function. And it seems to me that the authors are discussing the relationship between wage level but not the minimum wage and the labor demand. So it seems to me that it only applies to the case when the minimum wage is binding. So it is better to stay it clear in the paper than this is. Uh, this is uh, the second thing I'm a little bit confused is that uh, I don't. Un I, I I have thought about this uh, for a long time, but I kind of don't understand what's the intuition of this uh, labor demand because we have wage here in uh, in the uh, uh, numerator and also a wage there were a wage here in the denominator. So when the, when the wage increases, seems to me that the effect is like a counter uh, counting with each other, so what's the intuition underlying this, uh, this uh, effects of wage and then the labor, labor demand in the function they derive? So a small point is that sigma is defined in the appendix bundle in the main text, uh, which is uh, here. So it's just a small point. So for me, actually, um, I think the, the, the toy model could be enough, like when, when the minimum wage is not binding, then there is no effect. When the minimum wage is binding, that is a negative effect. So on average, depending on the fraction of firms affected by the minimum wage, the, the, there might be some negative effects on average. So, and I also have some uh, comments on the empirical study. I think the way to construct a neighbor pair is a bit strange to me because uh, the authors uh, use this formula to define pair, for example, like county A and county B is a pair if the Growth rate of minimum wage is larger than uh, is larger than uh, threshold, but the, in the paper, the authors also argue that the minimum wage are determined by many county level variables. So, if we have two counties having very different growth rate of the minimum wage, can we still think these counties are compared to each other? Meaning that one is treatment, the other one is control. So, this is actually uh, this is actually really confusing to me. And the second thing I'm a little bit confused is uh, the empirical specification. The, in, the, in the paper, the authors do the first difference and then get this uh, regression function. And the typo is that in the regression function, there is no minimum wage, but maybe they have corrected this uh, typo. And I, 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 I kind of don't understand how, how this specification identify the, identify the, the effects of minimum wage. Actually, this is a question, but not a comment. I, I, I kind of don't understand how they identify the, 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 the effects. So maybe the authors can answer the question. And also the second thing is that because, because according to their definition, the neighbor pair change every year. So I, I'm also kind of a little bit confused how they, how they do the first difference of the firm because one firm might appear many times in the data. So this is uh, uh, one confusion. 
And the authors also argue that by including many variables significantly affecting minimum wage in a regression can solve the endogenous problem, but I think this could not be enough because these variables are included in the in the in the regression linearly, but but the policy maker might make the de decision using some like nonlinear formula. So it could be misspecified. Additionally, they include very few surprise side variables. And the second thing which confused me is that because According to my understanding, the, the main variation the authors use comes from cross county variations, but the authors investigate the determinant of minimum wage in the, in the city level, which is presented in section uh, 6.1, and also they control the city level variables in the regression. So I was wondering why, why, they, why don't they just use the, the, the city level minimum wage to do some like a cross city comparison? So I'm kind of confused why they. Uh, they, are, they, 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 they claim that the variation comes from the county level variation, but they, they, when, they, when they investigate the, the, the source of this variation, they, they use uh, many city level variables to explain such kind of a county level variation. So I'm kind of confused. Uh, there are also some minor comments. In the figure two and three, they show that relative minimum wage to average wage, but I think it's better to present a figure showing the minimum wage, the level minimum wage, but not the relative minimum wage, over time across the county, which help us to understand the variation. And the second thing is a very minor point. They also mentioned that they use the provincial CPI to adjust different living costs in different regions. But using, as we know, the CPI cannot adjust different living costs across different regions at a given time point. So they might want to refer to this paper. They provide a, a spatial deflator they, are, they, they actually construct a, the spatial deflator to adjust the cross region living costs. And the second, and then the, the third minor point is that in the second page of, uh, in the second paragraph on page 12, the author said that starting firm level employment only requires such control for equilibrium outcome in the market that we do not need to consider a large sum of in, in intangible set of demands and surprise effect at the aggregate level. Uh, I'm kind of confusing because um, I first mind that what's the equilibrium I can't refer to. I think they refer to the equilibrium wage and equilibrium employment, but but I think the equilibrium equilibrium outcome is always determined by the demand supply. So why I don't understand why they also think they do not need to consider demand side and supply side factors. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of confusing to me. So these are all my comments and questions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lin Xiangye from Nanjing University of Finance and Economics. Uh, this paper is advised by Professor Li Shi and uh, Professor Ding Ding. Uh, uh, minimum wage policy has been uh, more and more emphasized in China. Uh, most of relevant empirical studies focused on the effect of minimum wage policy, but the results are mixed, just uh, as uh, several, uh, several presentations shows. Uh, for example, some, exam some studies find uh, significant and negative impacts on employment, while others find no impact. Maybe the reason is that these studies uh, focused uh, different uh, type of workers or different type of firms or different uh, re region. So maybe the effect of minimum wage policy depends on which type of workers or, or firms are examined and uh, what, what type of region of the country is studied. Mm. At, uh, on the other hand, in fact, whether minimum wage policy have in fact also depend on whether firms comply with minimum wage policy. As we know, in most uh, developing countries, the enforcement and uh, uh, compliance of minimum wage policy is not perfect. Uh, in our people, we use a matched firm and employee data to examine at what degree to which minimum wage policy are compliant with. And we also uh, identify 
uh, which type of workers in which type of firms are most likely to be affected by minimum wage policy in China. Mm. Uh, relevant uh, literature review. Uh, in China, there have been very few empirical studies e examining evidence of compliance with minimum wage policy. Mm. Some studies present evidence, but only for a subset of Chinese works or firms. Uh, for example, Xie Yong, uh, 2010, surveyed 485 rural migrants in Jiangsu province. And uh, Sun and Shu, 2011, started, studied rural migrants in Guangdong. In Guangdong. Uh, du Yang uh, used data from five capital cities in Shanghai, Wuhan, uh, Shenyang, Fuzhou, and Xi'an. All these uh, studies found that minimum wage policy is complied very well. But uh, most uh, workers, especially rural workers, work overtime, but not receive overtime pay. Mm. Uh, du Yang also find out that uh, rural migrants' wage is more likely to be below minimum wage policy than city residents. Uh, Carlin uh, used uh, annual urban household from 2002 and 2009, find that uh, the proportion of workers whose total monthly wage below the minimum wage is 5.6 but they did not consider workers' working hours. So uh, in summary, the existing studies suggest that uh, monthly, monthly minimum wage for full-time for full -time work uh, is complied very well, but uh, firms often violate the regulations regarding pay for overtime. Let me introduce our data. Our data is for the year uh, 2009. Uh, this data was collected in 2010 by Professor Li Shi and the uh, Ministry of Human Resources. Uh, to construct the sample of firms, six uh, provinces from different regions in China were chosen. These provinces are Guangdong, Shandong, Beijing and Jiangsu, Hubei and uh, Shanxi, uh, six provinces. Uh, then in each province, three to five cities were chosen. Generally, uh, three different kind of cities were chosen. The capital city in China, the capital city in one province, uh, almost uh, very developed. And then one medium developed uh, city and one least developed uh, city for each province. Uh, at last, in each city, uh, enterprise were randomly chosen. After clean, we have 2,835 enterprise are chosen from six provinces, uh, 39 cities, and 249 counties. Yeah, it should be Shanxi, two A's in Shanxi, <laughs> <laughs> the Western Shanxi. Uh, Shanxi. Yeah. Should be two A's. Right. Otherwise, it's Taiyuan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Enter, uh, enterprise level variables include ownership, uh, the average number of employees, enterprise size, revenue, profit, total cost, and uh, Etc. And uh, in every in every enterprise, uh, all uh, employees are chosen. But uh, because our data is for 2009, it's yearly data. So uh, employees uh, were hired or filed in 2009 are not included in our data. So at last. Uh, 
employee level variables include sex, age, education, attainment, occupation, position, working hours. Uh, our uh, employee, employee level data provide not only total wage, total wage, but also its different uh, components. We have four, uh, four parts of total wage, basic wage, bonus, supplements, and overtime pay. Uh, um, basic wage is fixed before the workers work, and uh, bonus can differ between different uh, individuals and are based on the productivity of workers. Supplements are given to workers with certain job uh, characteristics, such as those who work in special conditions, for, for example, night hours, or, or who have more years of tenure in the firm. Overall, uh, 65 of the wage paid to the work is uh, basic wage, and 20% uh, uh, of wage are, are attributed <coughs> to bonus, 7.6% from overtime pay, and 6.7% uh, uh, from supplements. Uh, from different samples, uh, from totally uh, least skilled workers uh, receive the small, smallest fraction of their wage as a bonus. These same workers are often likely to receive a larger uh, fraction of their total wage as overtime pay. Uh, then we consider compliance with legal minimum wage in China. Uh, first, we want to examine who earns less than the monthly minimum wage. Uh, as we know, according to uh, Chinese minimum wage regulation, of, of regulation, monthly minimum wage is applied to full-time job, and uh, hourly minimum wage is applied to part-time works. Our data is about phone funds, so our data is about full-time works. Uh, in comparing wages to minimum wages, the regulation um, makes it clear that the wage includes any bonus, but not include overtime pay and the legally mandated supplements. In our data, uh, we cannot distinguish between supplements that are legally required to be included and those not included. For this reason, we construct two measures of the wage when comparing to the minimum wage. The first is basic, basic wage plus a bonus, and the second is basic wage plus bonus plus supplements, two measures. Subsidy? Yeah. Subsidy is yeah. better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm. So, type two, we can we calculate percent of workers whose monthly wage is below the monthly legal minimum wage. Uh, totally, the proportion is very low. Uh, basic wage plus bonus is uh, three point four, and the basic wage plus bonus plus uh, subsidies, subsidies is 2.1 uh, from, uh, 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 from different uh, uh, type of workers. We find uh, low human capital workers, this proportion is higher. For example, female, uh, junior high school or, uh, or below is 5.4 and uh, young workers and uh, no uh, work appearance is quite uh, higher. Uh, it is interesting is that from different ownership, uh, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Michael funded funds, this proportion is quite high, quite high. Uh, and uh, uh, from different uh, fund size and uh, different region, we found in Guangdong, in Guangdong, this proportion is quite higher. As we know, in Guangdong, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Taiwan, 
uh, fronted uh, forms, the proportion is very hi higher. Maybe these two uh, factors is correlated. And uh, uh, from different uh, label intensive, so uh, label intensive forms, um, this proportion is quite higher. And uh, we from different uh, sec sectors. Uh, so uh, totally uh, compared to other developing countries, we found very few full-time workers earn less than the monthly minimum wage in China. As we know, in other uh, developing countries, this proportion uh, most is about 20%. So in other countries, this proportion is quite, uh, developing countries, this proportion is quite, quite high. But in China, this proportion is, quite, is very uh, low. <coughs> so second, we, we want to consider complying with overtime pay regulations. Uh, according to labor law, uh, workers who work more than 40 hours per week should be paid at least 1.5 times their regular, regular hourly wage for overtime hours than they work. Uh, our, our data allows us to separate overtime pay from regular pay. But we do not, do not know overtime hours is at weekend or holidays. But uh, at least we know overtime pay is uh, 1.5 times of their regular, regular hourly wage. <coughs> to examine whether employers are complying with overtime pay regulations, we examine the following statistics. The first is what percent of workers work more than four times. The second is what percent of workers work more than four times but not paid any overtime pay. And, sec uh, and the third is what percent of workers are paid less than 1.5 times the legal minimum wage for overtime hours than they work. The uh, last is what percent of workers are paid less than 1.5 times their regular pay for overtime hours that is the work. And uh, this is table three. We find <coughs> workers who work overtime hours, the proportion is very high, 41.3. Uh, and uh, this, in, in these workers, 11.8 uh, workers who worked overtime hours but do not get any overtime, overtime pay is 11.8. And uh, uh, workers whose hourly overtime pay is smaller than 1.5 times regular pay, the proportion is 28.7. And the uh, uh, proportion of workers whose hourly overtime pay is smaller than 1.5 times hourly hourly minimum wage is 17, 17. And uh, for some group of workers, this proportion is more higher. For example, uh, for little education attainment, this proportion is quite higher, more higher. And uh, young workers and uh, no uh, work impurance and, uh, uh, and from different uh, ownership, we find that uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Michael founded for uh, the, the workers who work overtime hours, the proportion is very high. And, uh, and from different, <coughs> from different phone size and from different uh, from revenue per work and uh, from different uh, sector. Uh, it is interesting is uh, these two uh, sector, Apple and uh, textile products and ma manufacturing and uh, communication equipment and uh, computer manufacturing, these two uh, sector uh, workers work, work overtime, the proportion is quite high. high. As we know, uh, most uh, th these two sectors uh, Forms 
are more likely to export, export. and from different uh, uh, region, Guangdong, and uh, the proportion is quite higher, quite higher. Mm. In summary, we find evidence of substantial violations of overtime pay regulations in China. Mm. Uh, in order, as we know, uh, we from different type of firms and different type of uh, firms, we want to know uh, compliance. Uh, in order to control all factors, we construct binary choice model and uh, explain the variables are whether or not workers' wage below minimum wage or whether or not overtime pay is below 1.5 times regular pay. And explaining uh, variables <coughs> include personal characters, foreign characters, and uh, industry uh, dummies and uh, region characteristics. And uh, we used binary uh, linear choice model, not, to not profit or logic model, because uh, binary linear choice model is easy to uh, decompose. All variables are standard, standardized in here. Uh, at first, we want to know the factors uh, affect whether workers' wage below minimum wage. <coughs> Personal character we find uh, uh, female, uh, the, the big factor is uh, affect uh, factor is uh, education attainment. Uh, junior high school or below, uh, this proportion is, way, is very big, uh, the big factors. Uh, this is uh, personal, personal uh, characters. And then we examine uh, foreign character and uh, we find only uh, this, only this Variable is uh, very big, a lot of foreign uh, revenue per work. Maybe uh, labor intensive workers are more likely to, their wage are more likely to below minimum wage. And uh, uh, region characters is minimum wage and uh, GDP uh, per capita and the proportion of export to GDP. I find the for regional characters, the big factors is a proportion of, of export to GDP, and then is GDP per capita, and then minimum wage. Uh, this is for uh, compliance with minimum wage, uh, monthly minimum wage, and then we, we want to say uh, hourly minimum wage overtime pay regulation if foreign compliant. I find we find that for personal characters, the the same as as before uh, is education attainment. Uh, junior high school or below, this uh, it is a big big factor, big factor. And uh, then for then for uh, for for characteristics is is a foreign size foreign size. And uh, large for is not significant, um, but uh, it is negative because in our data, they are very, the proportion of large forms is very low, is very, very low. But uh, we find uh, from science that large and medium forms, uh, their, their work, uh, workers' uh, wage uh, Below minimum wage policy, uh, minimum wage is the, the proportion is lower than small uh, foreign size, and uh, uh, very interested is uh, for regional characteristics. We find minimum wage is not significant. Uh, our minimum wage uh, minimum wage is from county level, county level. So we find. Uh, Minimum wage policy have no significant uh, effect 
for overtime pay uh, regulations. So maybe uh, in China, overtime work is uh, widespread, but it is not because minimum wage policy. So uh, for our data, we didn't find evidence that minimum wa wage policy, uh, minimum wage increase workers working hours. So we do another uh, regression. Wait, wait, wait. So it didn't increase working hours, it didn't increase uncompensated working hours? Sorry? You said it didn't increase working hours, or it didn't increase working hours for which you don't get overtime pay? Mm, it, at first, this, this two is overtime pay. Okay. And then the last two column is uh, working, working hours and whether or not work overtime. And uh, uh, for this, for these four uh, uh, equations, do, do not uh, is not significant. So uh, maybe uh, in my opinion, is in, in China work, uh, workers work overtime is widespread, but uh, it is not minimum wage policy, and this is uh, overtime regulation, and. Uh, uh, then we want to examine who is more likely to be affected by minimum wage. Uh, I think the, first, the following two type of workers are more likely to be affected by minimum wage policy. The first, uh, workers whose wage just equal minimum wage are more, like, more likely to be affected by minimum wage wages. And the second, as we know, uh, the average increase in minimum wage is around 10%. So looking at workers earning between minimum wage and 110% uh, of the minimum wage is, uh, is an estimate of workers likely to be affected by minimum wage changes. Mm, table, table four is about uh, proportion of workers whose wage equals the minimum wage plus 10%. Uh, it is interesting, we find so many workers, their basic wage is equal minimum wage. Here is, uh, is 4 and uh, 4.9. And uh, the proportion of workers whose wage uh, between minimum wage to 1.1 times minimum wage is uh, 9.3. But even for low wage uh, workers, they uh, get, they also get uh, bonus and uh, uh, supplements. When we consider bonus, this proportion uh, decreases greatly. So uh, workers whose basic wage plus bonus equal minimum wage is uh, decreased to 1.3. And then we consider supplements, this proportion uh, decreased to 0 0.8. And uh, so at first we find so many workers whose basic wage equal a minimum wage. For some type of workers, this proportion is uh, even higher. For example, uh, female and uh, junior high school or below, or young workers and, uh, and workers with little experience and uh, wo many workers with no skill uh, certificate, this proportion is more higher. And uh, for different uh, font size and uh, uh, from different region, we find in Beijing and Jiangsu, this, this proportion is very higher than uh, other province. And uh, uh, here is uh, from different sect uh, industrial sectors. And these two sectors, they are the proportion of export is very high. We find these two sectors, this proportion is uh, even big, even big. Mm. So, so we, f we at the first we find maybe uh, minimum wage have a great effect on basic wage. Um, but 
uh, the phones will uh, make full use of burners to adjust the wages. So at first we find this. And then we look at, uh, uh, at a kernel density graph. This is basic wage uh, density graph. We find at uh, zero, zero means basic wage equal minimum wage. And the, here it is, does exist uh, a spike. Uh, below minimum wage, there is a sensory. So this is basic wage. And then we want to consider a bonus. When we consider bonus, this regularity is not obvious than uh, basic wage. Then we consider uh, basic wage plus bonus and plus supplements. This uh, here, there is no obvious spikes. Spike, so in order to further ex explore the re uh, relationship between different components of the wage and the minimum wage, we regress different components of the wage on the level of the minimum wage. Uh, here is wage regulations. Uh, this is for all uh, data, for all data. Uh, dependent variable is monthly wage, and we find uh, minimum wage has a great effect on basic wage. Uh, at the same time, minimum wage has also big effect on bonus, but the sign is different. And uh, here is uh, positive, and uh, then for bonus is uh, negative. So we, when we consider uh, bonus and basic wage, then uh, minimum wage has no effect on basic wage plus bonus and uh, uh, plus uh, supplements. When uh, in we do many regulations, we find minimum wage has a great effect on basic wage. When we consider bonus, then the total wage is not significant. So this is for all samples, for uh, four samples. Four samples. So we find that there is uh, a, sig okay. a significant uh, positive, uh, positive correlation between the minimum wage and the basic wage. However, we find a, sig a significant negative correlation between minimum wage and bonus. So for most workers, the higher basic wage and the lower bonus cancel each other out. So they found out that higher minimum wage are not significant correlate with total wage. Mm. Our evidence suggests that when minimum wage increase for adjust the basic wage upward, but reduce bonus so that the total wage paid to workers do not change. While we find the total wage are not correlated with minimum wage for workers in general, it is possible that there are correlation for some subsets of workers. So, he, so the following is a different subset. subset. We find the uh, regularity is quite similar. For example, for, for a different gender, male and female, and uh, minimum wage has has a great effect on basic wage, but a negative effect on bonus. When we consider these two parts together, then there is no effect. And uh, for a different uh, education attainment, the, uh, the regularity is quite similar, quite similar. But there is one exception we find for uh, quite labor intensive funds, uh, the minimum wage has a great effect on, on basic wage and uh, for uh, basic wage plus uh, bonus. So for all uh, subgroups of workers, we find that higher minimum wage are positive correlate with uh, 
um, basic weight, but a negative correlate with burnouts. This, however, for workers in most labor intensive firms, higher minimum wage are significantly correlated with higher total wages. So uh, at last, we want to consider to examine who is more likely to be affected by minimum wage. And uh, the, the, the method is, uh, uh, is the same as before. Explaining the variables are whether or not workers' wage are between minimum wage and 110% uh, of minimum wage. Explaining variables include personal characters, form characters, industrial, uh, dummies, region characters. And this is a table. table. We find uh, female, female workers are more likely to be affected and then age is not significant. And experience is important. Uh, workers with more experience, their wage mm, more likely not affected by minimum wage. And then for, uh, the, for personal uh, characters, it is important for education attainment. Uh, junior high school or below this uh, coefficient is very high. And then for position in form is not significant. And the form for, for, for different ownership. And, uh, and, then, and then as before, for labor intensive forms are more likely, are more likely uh, affected by minimum wage. And uh, this is the regional characters. We find that the most important is uh, minimum wage, uh, the proportion of export to GDP. So then minimum wage. So at last, conclusions. So this is part of we, we need to, to say. So thank you. Employment regressions are sort of the reduced form version of an IV regression where you are regressing employment on wages and the instrument for wages with a minimum, with a minimum wage. Then what this paper in essence is getting at is trying to see whether, to establish whether there is a significant first stage, whether minimum wages even affect wages, whether, whether there's compliance. And compliance is especially important in developing countries where institutions tend to be weak. So this paper uses a very uh, impressive data set. They collect something like three, you know, data from 3,000 firms across a, a wide geographical location. Um, and in total, they, they survey over 520,000 um, um, employees. Um, so, so, so before, before talking with the, the speaker today, I thought that these were self-reported wage data, but it turns out that they're uh, they're, they're reported by the firm to the researchers, so, so not necessarily self-reported wage data. Uh, but these data are also representative. They match up quite well with the manufacturing census in terms of the demographics of the respondents and the firm characteristics. So the, the really striking result to me is that the minimum wage is not correlated with the actual wage. Okay, so, so and, and they look at this for um, many different cuts of the data. Um, males versus females, by educational attainment, by age. Um, there's almost no cut of the data that gives us a significant positive correlation. And a lot of the uh, estimates are actually negative. Okay, so we only have one significant positive correlation just for the most labor intensive firms. Okay, so, so what does this tell us? So the, the authors don't come out and say this, but to me, the implications are quite clear. Um, minimum wages in China seem to have a negligible effect on the actual wage, uh, and therefore it's unlikely that they can have any sort of employment effects. They're not even moving the wage in any way. And at the very least, I think it calls for more research to investigate whether there is a wage effect of the minimum wage before we investigate whether there are employment effects and other, other effects. And other uh, contributions um, of the paper, um, they find that basically firms are adjusting the basic 
pay according to the minimum wage, but then they compensate for it by lowering the bonus, okay? So that the total pay uh, isn't changing. So I guess one lesson for researchers working on labor in China is that you know, the basic wage is pretty much meaningless. What we really want to look at is the total wage that people are being paid. And it's a total wage that uh, falls under the minimum wage regulations, right? It's the total wage that should be above the minimum wage. So looking at the basic wage uh, would be meaningless. Um, and they find that firms violate overtime pay regulations quite often, and this affects uh, over 40% of the sample. So my takeaway from that is uh, if we're going to look at studies that use hourly pay versus studies using monthly pay, that can, you know, we can have very different pictures because, because of this uh, overtime pay issue. So here are my um, comments. So I guess my biggest critique is uh, with the definition of compliance <laughs> that, that they use. So the way I think about compli compliance is that you know, in the universe of the firms, we have those that are going to be affected and those that are not affected by the minimum wage, uh, depending on what their wage already is right, before the regulations, depending on the market wage that they already face. And then of the affected firms, we uh, could have firms that are compliant and firms that are non-compliant. But it seems that in the paper, the, uh, the way that compliance is defined includes all the unaffected firms as well. And so they go on to conclude that we find evidence that there's broad compliance with minimum wages um, in China. And so you know, if we were to take that definition of compliance, we can say that even Jack Ma's pay is you know, compliant with um, minimum wage regulation. Jack Ma is the CEO of Alibaba, for those of you who don't know. Um, so if instead we are going to think about compliance as a, a percentage of the, the uh, firms that are uh, affected, then I mean, ideally what we would have would be we would have panel data. Uh, we would look at changes in the minimum wage and how firms are responding to changes in the minimum wage. Uh, we don't, it doesn't seem like we have that here. Um, but we do have this very nice figure, okay? And this figure uh, is uh, showing us the difference in the, the a measure of the total wage uh, between the me a measure of the total wage and the minimum wage for the sample. And as the speaker pointed out, we find um, uh, no censoring, no bunching of the distribution at zero. And this suggests to me very low compliance. <laughs> um, if, if anything, it, does, it doesn't appear that firms are uh, complying with the minimum wage. It doesn't appear that the minimum wage is moving firms to, to zero. Um, now, you know, you can say that... Um, um, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if the, you know, what, what, what the distribution should, should look like, but, but by, the, by the author's own uh, analysis, they, they say that there's no censoring here. Um, so, 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 you know, it seems like there's, there's uh, not much compliance. If anything, there's, you know, very little uh, compliance. Um, so, you know, maybe we don't care so much about this group. You know, we, we really care about all the people that are getting paid above the minimum wage. But, but I think since we, you know, this, this paper uh, has compliance in the title, I think, I think, I think we are interested in this. So, so if we want to better understand the determinants of compliance with the minimum wage, um, I have uh, some suggestions. So one is that maybe we can just, you know, and this is in order of, onerousness to actually carry out. Um, so maybe the easiest thing to do, just zoom in on those potentially affected individuals. So just the people at this uh, left tail up to maybe 10 to 20% above the minimum wage um, and, and look for different cuts of the data, whether, uh, whether there is bunching, whether it seems like they're complying, right? And for example, are larger firms more likely to be compliant? Maybe larger firms are uh, maybe it'd be easier to detect violations, uh, minimum wage violations for larger, more established firms. You know, do we see that? You know, does it seem to make sense with our priors? Um, another thing maybe you can do, um, since you do have a firm survey, I don't know if you asked the firms to do this, but maybe you can just ask them to report on whether they 
um, adjusted their wages after there were changes in the regulations. You know, just ask the firm managers about that. Um, and, then, and then I guess the, the last one is um, the least feasible logistically, uh, but, but it'd be great if you collect another round of data. Um, I, I guess this data was collected in 2010, 2009, 2010, so it's been four years, and the minimum wage has to change at least every 10 years in China, uh, every two years in China. So, so there, there have been changes since then. And so if we could go back and collect another round of data, maybe we can identify these effects. Uh, more directly, you know, what, what, are, uh, what, what does compliance look like? Um, and it doesn't, it maybe is less challenging than, than it seems. I mean, you, you already can identify those who are uh, potentially affected, right? You, you, you already know who are the people in the left tail, and you can potentially only follow up on those people or, or you know, randomly survey a, a proportion of those people. Um, Okay, and, and, and if you do that, you can also even look at uh, employment effects uh, as well. And, and I, I thought that this, uh, this data set used, used self-reported data rather than firm-reported data, so I thought that maybe it would be uh, a contribution in that it would be more credible than firm-reported wages um, in the manufacturing census, but, but maybe that's not the case. Um, okay, so then my... my uh, Next point about comparisons of self-reported wages to firm-reported wages may, may not be feasible to do because that's not the case. But I think, I think this data set is poised nicely, poised nicely to help us clarify some of these data issues in the literature. Um, for example, uh, how does it compare in terms of just the basic descriptive statistics uh, with, the, the, with Carl's paper, right? And because Carl does find significant um, disemployment effects, whereas this paper suggests that we wouldn't find any effects at all. So how, how does it compare uh, in, these, in these basic statistics? Are there differences to begin with in the samples that we're working with? Um, just something to, um, to think about. Um, and then lastly, I just have a few um, uh, sort of questions, suggestions. So, so one is about the survey procedures. So um, I'm, I'm curious, the, the authors went uh, very very clear about this. Um, curious to know, you know, how how did the firms decide which employees you would be able to survey? Were the managers looking over their shoulders when they filled out the questionnaires? Um, how how were how were the firms selected from from this list? I just said that was randomly selected. Uh, what is the list of firms that that you selected from? Um, given that in the literature uh, in the U.S., for example, um, there have been a lot of critiques of studies where people collect their own surveys. You know, there have been doubts about the quality of, of these uh, data sets, like telephone surveys, for example. Um, I think it would, be, it would be useful to be more explicit about the, the survey procedures. Uh, okay, and then, and then lastly, I'm, I'm, I think uh, others have, have mentioned this today already, but what, what are the incentives for compliance in China. I'd like to know more about this. Um, maybe, you know, maybe there's spotty enforcement and, and that, that heterogeneity in enforcement is driving compliance. Um, uh, so if you can get data on um, maybe probability of being inspected, a history of violations, etc., you may be able to test something like the uh, Ashenfelter-Smith compliance model. Um, okay, and that's it. Thank you. Just put up one. Um, I just, just I'll have two slides, and that's it. Just, just more for your interest. So we looked at Brazil, India, and South Africa, and China. And um, if you look at uh, the real, at, we just did some basic indicators about the wage and the minimum wage. The real average monthly wages in U.S. dollars. So this is to make them a little bit more comparable. Uh, you can see. Um, you can see there, China is kind of second among this group. Uh, the real monthly minimum wage in U.S. dollars, China's uh, on the kind of lower end, actually, relative to uh, Brazil um, and South Africa. And if you do this as a percentage, uh, China's also, is that, a, is that consistent with, with the other papers today? I don't know, 20, that's what we had from, uh, so I think actually from maybe one of the papers here. So China is still low as relative to what's happening in some of the other emerging market. But what's really interesting too is what's been going on over time. If you just look at the wage growth in emerging markets, 
um, the, the, the total percent change in real wage, in, I'm sorry, in real average wages from 2003 to 2010, you can see in Brazil, 22%. India, no change really, slightly negative. South Africa, 18%. And China is you know, much faster than any of the other uh, countries. And China is also seeing a much faster increase in the minimum wage. Uh, and so this is kind of an interesting comparison. The minimum wage increase is, is just a little bit more than the uh, average wage increase. And the other countries are kind of all over the place in the sense that uh, well, I, South Africa, the, the growth rates are similar. Um, in Brazil, you see the minimum wage going a lot faster than average wages. And in India as well. So, I mean, as a whole, it looks like these emerging market countries are, are they're all definitely uh, imposing minimum wages and the minimum wage growth are, are generally growing faster than uh, average wages. So they're, they're definitely a policy issue that's important and potentially going to have increasing effects on labor market outcomes, you know, if, 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 if that's important, the fact that the, the ratio as a share of wages is going up. And then, uh, so we did some just pictures. The, the, the trends of real wages, unemployment rates, and minimum wages are kind of, you know, vastly different across the countries. Um, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, this is uh, China. Um, this, uh, the unemployment rate data from the 2000 census, the 2005 mini census, and then the 2010 census are probably the best unemployment, re unemployment rate estimates plotted here. And you can see, you know, the, the real uh, minimum wage has been going up throughout this period, as have real wages. So there's no real, I mean, as, as we just said, there, you can't really say too much uh, from just comparing time series. but. Um, that's, then we kind of reviewed the studies that we are aware of, including I think one by Newmark um, on Brazil and India that are you know that actually do regression analysis and try to try to estimate it. South Africa is a bit more, and then finally we conclude that uh, you know this thing is what I just said that minimum wages are increasing faster, uh, but there are big differences across countries. There seems to be less evidence. This is our reading of those studies. There seems to be less evidence of big negative employment effects. Although today we've had some big negative effects for China, so that and, and they're all small literature, so this could easily be revised. Um, and there's lots of issues related to enforcement and compliance that I think may underlie this kind of characterization. There was a World Bank yeah. project that ended around three, four years ago where they did they did they reviewed the evidence from lots and lots of countries. Right. Okay. And there's going to be a conference. I can advertise Leisha's conference, uh, which is occurring in October which is international, and we'll have people coming from India and also many of these different countries. We're many it's, it's a focus on minimum wages in developing countries, so I think we'll learn more there about the comparative experience. Okay, so that's it. Now, I want to just close. I know you're all tired, but I thought it would be useful since, especially for some of our keynote speakers, they're probably taking in a lot of new information. It would be a good uh, opportunity to just allow for a few minutes for people to kind of offer some thoughts about what what they've learned, and also if there if there is any uh, new kind of uh, insights into what the policy implications of all the things we've learned today are, either for you know China, Hong Kong, or anywhere else. Now, you know, and and the nice thing about it is, you know, that you can always instrument to do with measurement error, but you can do other things to do with measurement error, like measure stuff better. And I think that's, um, that's a useful thing to think about. Um, the second point I wanted to make is just something that, that often gets lost sight of. You know, we, we often talk about elasticity as minus 0.1, minus 0.5, minus 0.5, whatever. Um, and we say, oh, those are small. Well, I, I've, I've said this before, not today, though, but you know, that's, a, that's a really tricky concept, right? Because <laughs> what we, I, 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 we you know, I don't know this expression, you know, we have to sort of compare, we have this, this idiom in English where we say, you know, are you, you're comparing apples and oranges, right? You're sort of comparing two different things. And that's kind of what you're doing there, right? Because what you're always, what we're always computing in these regressions, and I think we've included all the ones we today, was the elasticity of an employment rate for some group relative to the legislative minimum wage, okay? And th there's two things, there's two things that are funny about that, right? One is, um, the legislated minimum wage, you know, and then people use that to say, oh, does it, does, you know, a low elasticity must mean people are, you know, on average helped a lot, right? Um, well, first of all, the minimum wage goes up by less than the legislated minimum wage, typically, either because of non-compliance or 
in the U.S., for example, where we raise the minimum wage every once in a while, because a lot of people's wages have crept up above the old minimum, and then maybe they get swept up to the new one, right? So the sort of implied wage effect is smaller than the legislative effect, right? And also, of course, that elasticity is only identified from affected workers who, who are always a subs. Even if you're doing the you know employment regression for you know people with high school education or less or whatever, a lot of them aren't affected by the minimum wage anyways. So the, the, what we care about is what is the elasticity for, for those who would actually potentially benefit from the minimum wage? And that's always a much bigger number. Well, it's always a bigger number, and it can't be a much bigger number than absolute value, like a bigger, bigger negative number than these elasticity. I think that's, that's actually very important to think about. Um, uh, certainly those of you who like to talk to reporters and say, oh, small effects, blah, 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 it's not so clear. And the only thing I'd say is this issue of compliance is clearly, like if there's gonna be a continuing conversation, Clearly, something to sort out because I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite sure we all drew the same conclusions from your paper, um, uh, but if, if we did, and if what Jane drew from it is that in fact, I, in fact, when I was listening to you and I listened to Jane, I thought you guys weren't exactly agreeing, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it's obviously a key issue, right? Um, so Carl's estimates sort of fit the standard literature, and, and you say you have the earnings regressions results that are similar. Um, the other paper, the firm level data, you know, the LCS is much bigger, and in fact, minimum you know, wages aren't raising wages, then we're, we're getting something else, but it must be spurious. Um, so it's worth, worth sorting that out. Great. Thanks. Um, John, do you want to well, help? Come? I'm still trying to digest what, uh, what I've heard um, about um, the China experience and Hong Kong experience. Uh, when I look at the Hong Kong experience, it r reminds me just the, the, the history of uh, uh, the, the move towards legislation. It reminds me of what's gone on in other countries. Especially reminds me of the German situation as opposed to the Workers' Directive providing a basis for minimum wage legislation in a number of activities before the national minimum wage comes in, uh, uh, 2015, at uh, 8 euros 50. So a large amount of commonality in terms of uh, procedures, commissions, um, perhaps uh, not enough is, is perhaps understood about how the drive towards legislation might be affected by the decline of the union movement. I think this is what we're seeing in, in uh, certainly seeing in Germany that the impetus towards legislation has not just come from a coalition government, but from you know, the basic decline of collective bargaining. <coughs> and so that may be a cost you have to bear of, uh, you know, of, of uh, it's not an issue there in Hong Kong, <coughs> I, I admit, but uh, it, it is in other countries. I think the subtlety of the situation in China, uh, uh, it was a thing that came across. You know, the difficulty of measuring uh, uh, minimum wages. Or, and then, how do, you measure, uh, how do you measure compliance? How do you measure these things? It's much simpler in the United States. The only thing we have to worry about is what, tip workers? There is no, uh, there is no uh, uncovered sector as such. Yes. Uh, so it reminded me of what's going on in lots of other countries' research, sometimes uh, in less developed countries that are called, where you have compliance, uh, compliance issues loom very large. And where uh, the, that requires to be considered in much more detail, compliance, how this is affecting results. And I'm a, I'm a little confused. I'm still a little confused about what we've learned today. You, you mentioned it in terms earlier of effects earnings, big effect on earnings, uh, and yet there seems to be a, a non-compliance non problem. Uh, I, I find it difficult to you know, square that, uh, to, to understand that. So I'm in a state of shock in the sense of, or information overload on, on, on the situation here. I'm also struck about, by the similarity of a lot of the research that's going on. The Board of Counties uh, research struck me as very similar to what was being done in, in the United States, but perhaps but much more subtle in a sense. Uh, 
I, I'm wondering if it, uh, if it was, uh, uh, I wonder how much of it was dictated by the American research and how much of it was sort of homegrown. Um, I think a lot of it was, the subtlety was homegrown. I, f I found that rather interesting. Uh, I'm still not sure what I've learned about it, and it's the sort of thing that at the end, I'd like to read all the papers. And so I hope we're going to get the chance uh, to do that, yeah. and even comment further on them to the individual authors. And that's what I think, perhaps, what could be our greatest contribution, perhaps, rather than a quick uh, uh, you know, uh, summary sure. of what we've learned. Well, maybe, uh, maybe we could divvy it up between us. You know. but, I'll just uh, pick some. <laughs> I thought that was coming. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, a little bit of information overload, uh, to be honest, and I'd like a little bit more time to reflect on things. Great. But I'm really quite impressed by the, the quality of the research. I think that's what I like to get across, and both in terms of the descriptives and in terms of the analytics. And I think this is uh, is very refreshing. Uh, so I think I've learned a lot, but I have to I have to think about it. <laughs> uh, but I've certainly I've certainly come away with a feeling that uh, there's still life in that in the in, in the subject. As, as you know, we said earlier, the gift that gives on giving. Uh, I'm not sure to who, but it's certainly it, it, it's certainly a learning experience, and I'm going to read this stuff with interest and hopefully uh, understand more. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have the same feeling. Uh, uh, really learn a lot from the conference. Research is a different data, get a different result. Sometimes the government say, oh, you say really confuse me. You know, what kinds of advice we should get from you? Say, that means they really need a high quality research yeah, on these issues. So that means uh, what kinds of high quality research you want to know that? So I think first is the data set. That's important. Uh, up to now, we're using uh, uh, some data set can be used for such research, but not so good enough. So we need to collect uh, high quality, appropriate, the data. Uh, second, is, uh, yeah, we really need some good methodology. So that means we like to do some cooperation with the international. 
so in the October, we will organize the international conference on the new way to policy in the developing countries. Uh, next year, yeah, uh, when our project finishes, we want to organize another uh, conference that is uh, is broader issues to become also even for the China to learn something from the developing countries. Uh, so that means that we would like to say, increase cooperation, international cooperation. Yeah. Also, you say, we like to you say, increase communications you say, with the government. Yeah, like Try to get you say, our research more policy oriented. Okay. I think that's important. Great. Thank you. Great. And finally, Wing. Um, I'm, I think I'm the least qualified one to speak here because I've, <laughs> I've never written a single paper on minimum wage. What's your objective? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm a half knowledgeable consumer of this literature, so I, I think I can I can say a few words about about it from the you know, from the producer side point of view. I can say a few words. Uh, one of you. Um, I also just happen happened to sit on this minimum wage commission, so um, there was a lot of opportunity for me to to uh, do this consultation with um, a lot of segments of society, and we receive a lot of letters, and some many of them are even handwritten letters. So, so I, I I happen to so know what people care about. Um, um, I guess. The, one of the background is that perhaps because the minimum wage was introduced at a very good time and the labor market was very tight, so there's, there's, uh, um, there's not too much talk about um, employment effect, at least so far. Um, you don't know what's going to happen if uh, we set it. But, uh, so far, uh, it, it has not been an uh, agenda that has been on most people's minds. Um, um, but uh, so what I what I find the so most people people are concerned about minimum wage. There, there are several issues which seem to be um, neglected in the relatively speaking neglected in the academic literature. Um, one is um, what uh, Silva just mentioned about not on the back. Everybody talks about it. Um, there's this issue about internal relativity. You want to maintain the ranking difference. There's also a lot of talk about um, about labor market reallocation because of the, especially at the point when it starts from new to something. Um, so the, the, the most common story was that um, the, the restaurants, they, all, they lost all their workers uh, because the workers want to, go, want to become security guards. They pay the same, but the, the work is much easier. Uh, the only only hold to this 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 story is that the security card, card security card companies are also complaining that their workers <laughs> somehow disappear somewhere. <laughs> uh, but um, but I think that there, there is indeed a difference between introducing a minimum wage and kind of adjusting it. Um, um, it seems like there there was some evidence that it causes quite a bit of uh, reallocation. I think the, the business sector exaggerated a little bit, but um, I, my personal prior was somewhat uh, changed, especially by the, by the picture that still to was about the relative wage increase of the different percentiles. There seems to be some pretty good, at least at the aggregate level, they evidence which suggests that you know, the, the minimum wage is affecting the bottom 10 percentile, but even the 20 percentile. And, 30 percent out seems to be fairly, fairly strong effect, which we don't see in other years. And also, we didn't see the same thing when the minimum wage was adjusted be, uh, between uh, in year 2013, because at that point, the adjustment was only two dollars, so it was a much, much, uh, much uh, smaller impact. The fact that I, I can't see the same thing actually kind of like a people test that seems to suggest that there's something there. 
so, so that's, that's one thing um, I find kind of quite interesting. And I, I, there are only a few papers in the academic literature that deals with it, and the evidence is mixed. But uh, it seems like something, at least in this part of the world, seems, seems to be very important. The other thing that I, I find the overwhelming uh, sentiment in many parts of the community was that um, people worry about inflation. So part of it is our fault that we, we didn't teach them the difference between inflation and price level, but I, I shouldn't be prestigious. I, I think there's something real to it. Uh, there, there is relatively little research on the effect of minimum wage on price level. And in, in this part of the world, it's felt quite keenly. Uh, I think for <coughs> several reasons. One is that uh, we have these uh, people live in apartments, so everybody has to pay management fees. And these management fee, management companies, they are typically hiring security guards, janitors, garbage collection. These are all very low wage jobs. And um, um, there seems to be some evidence that they, the management fees are rising very quickly. And most people would attribute it to, at least partly, to, um, to minimum wage hikes. Um, there's also I think the evidence is a little bit less clear, but there's also a lot of complaints, at least from the community, about uh, restaurants and food prices. Uh, this is, I think, a little bit less justified because during the last few years there was quite a bit of imported food inflation. But at the same time, I can't really completely rule uh, it out. Um, I kind of take a little bit issue with what David has just said about the minimum wage industries are largely kind of more uh, attacking the rich because it seems like um, many of the, the, the more... Um, I was speculating. Right? More, <laughs> more the yeah. case for Hong Kong than <laughs> for the U.S. The U.S. <laughs> is clearly the poor. Because it seems like uh, many of the, if you look at retail shops, the mom and pop shops are more influenced than papaya than the brand name and those are primarily frequented by the poor. So um, I, I indeed saw a lot of um, concern about price level, which I think um, is the order of first order, first order importance, which has been largely ignored by the profession. So um, I think I'm just sort of sharing with the producers here that uh, it, would be, it would be useful to see more studies uh, on those two fronts. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any final comments from anyone uh, in the audience? Okay, so we're right at time. So let me, I, w I did want to, um, actually for the emerging market minimum wage stuff, I did want to acknowledge Ching Sha, who did all the work on that, and so we're working together on that, and also a, you're a, an undergraduate student who helped us. Um, uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge all of the administrative support and volunteer support for today's event. For our staff at IMS, Lois and Carla, I'm not sure if they're in the room. Are they not? In, they're not in the room, but let's give them a, a round of applause anyway. Let's we'll tell them about that. Um, and then finally, dinner tonight is in uh, an old fishing village near here, uh, so it's very good seafood. And uh, if you haven't told us yet but still want to come, just let me know. I think we might have uh, one or two more uh, spots left um, where we can squeeze in. Uh, so just just come along. The bus should be down waiting for us now uh, at the entrance. You can take a couple of minutes and go to the bathroom or get your stuff together, but uh, just meet down at the entrance to the building. Uh, the bus will be there. <laughs>